right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the January 9th Planning Commission meeting. You all please stand and join me in the salute to the flag. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Sue, roll call, please. Okay, good morning. Um, Mr. Cannon. Here. Mr. Herzog. Here. Mr. Johnson. Here. Mr. Nader. Here. Mr. Hauge. Here. Mr. Sevison. Yes. Mr. Moss. Yes. Thank you. Morning, AJ. Good morning, Chairman, members of the Commission. EJ Baldi with the Planning Service Division. Uh, welcome back. Hopefully, everybody had a good holiday break uh, since our last meeting on December 12th. Uh, as you can see, we have a live video feed up to our uh, Tahoe City Administrative Office, so welcome everybody who's up in Tahoe today. Uh, so, first time in several years we've actually started off the new year with all seven commissioners, if you can believe that. So, uh, thank you for being here today, and of course, thank you for your continued service. Uh, and Chairman Moss, uh, you have successfully navigated us through <laughs> 2019. Uh, we had a lot of high profile and some contentious projects during the year, so uh, thank you for kind of your leadership during that time and, and your service as well. For uh, board meetings, uh, there was only one board meeting since we last met, and I don't have anything to report back on that, on that meeting, uh, but I do want to point out that on Jan January 28th, the board will be taking up your recommendation on the Placer County Sustainability Plan. Uh, so that, again, is going to be on January 28th at the Board of Supervisors. And then for planning commission schedule this year, uh, I can probably guarantee you the first quarter of this year is going to be pretty busy. So uh, on January 23rd, uh, we have a fairly light agenda that's going to be in Auburn, that meeting. Uh, next one is February 13th, uh, where we hope to bring the winery and farm brewery ordinance. Uh, that effort has been going on for several years, so we're uh, excited to bring that here. And then, uh, just to make sure it's on your radar, the Placer County Conservation Plan uh, looks like it could be coming as soon as the end of February, uh, when that's, uh, that's what we're thinking right now. So lots of things uh, in the next several months, and I'm sure there'll be more to add afterwards. And that's all I have. So unless you have questions, we can get started. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is selection of officers for the 2020. Okay, if uh, I can start it. First, I want to thank you, Jeff, for your leadership this last year. As EJ said, we did have some challenging uh, times, and I appreciate you navigating us through it. In the seven years that I've been on the commission, uh, I've been honored to serve as chair uh, once, and I appreciate the opportunity to see it, what we do from the chair position. So I, I think it's important to rotate uh, people, and uh, Larry's indicated he'd like to hold in his spot as vice chair. So I would like to move that uh, Anders Hauge move up from his secretary position to uh, be chair for 2020. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. Now, are we going to do all these separately then? Is that? Yes, that'd be the proper process. Okay. Roll call, please, Sue. I have a motion by Mr. Nader, a second by Mr. Cannon. So a vote for Mr. Cannon, please. Yes. Mr. Herzog? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Nader? Yes. Mr. Hauge? Yes. Mr. Sevison? Yes. Mr. Moss? Yes. Thank you. I would like to further move that... Uh, Larry Severson stay on as our vice chair for uh, 2020. I'll second that. Motion and a second. Roll call, please, Sue. I have a motion by Mr. Nader, a second by Mr. Cannon. So vote for Mr. Cannon, please. Yes. Mr. Herzog? Yes. Mr. Johnson? 
Yes. Mr. Nader? Yes. Mr. Hauge? Yes. Mr. Sevison? Yes. Mr. Moss? Yes. Thank you. Do we have any advice left? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I'll, my final motion would be, uh, as we line up for uh, uh, moving forward uh, with the representing the different districts, um, the next person in line would uh, be Nathan Herzog, move up as uh, secretary. So I would make that motion. And I'll second. Motion and a second made. Roll call, please, Sue. I have a motion from Mr. Nader and a second by Mr. Cannon. So a vote for Mr. Cannon. Yes. Mr. Hersog? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Nader? Yes. Mr. Hauge? Yes. Mr. Sevison? Yes. Mr. Moss? Yes. Thank you. Take a minute and rotate here. Oh, we actually move? <laughs> <laughs> I get to stay in my chair. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. See you later. At least I'll switch the spots here, yeah. Don't you keep your same chair? Nope. You got it all warmed up? Oh, there. this one rocks. I got that one lowered. <laughs> <sighs> well, thank you, Jeffrey. Again, I appreciate the last year of leadership. So at this time, uh, I believe it's uh, time for public comment. Um, you're going to have to help me out on some of the language you usually use, but I believe the comments are limited to three minutes. Three minutes. And it's on items that are not on the agenda today. Oh, we do have somebody. Yep. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, Ellie Waller for the record. Um, Happy New Year. Uh, glad to have the opportunity to speak from Tahoe. I want to thank Sue uh, for all her efforts over the years and continuing. Uh, she's been a, an asset and helpful to the community members. Um, I'd like to pull the uh, visions at Tahoe for discussion um, on the extension of the permit. And secondly, I'd like to ask um, the commissioners, have you received a recent update on the uh, La Lima project? Um, the original Tonal Palo project was in 2003. It changed hands, so on and so forth. At your July 25th hearing, uh, as reported in the minutes, 12 members of the public provided comments, motions as follows. Continue the item to an open date to obtain additional public input facilit by, facilitated by the county between applicant and community members. Uh, Commissioner Nader moved. Commissioner Sevenson seconded. Eyes, uh, one abstained. Howie, I'd like to know uh, if there's anything recent that anybody can report soon at some meeting. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Are there other public comments? Oh. Go ahead. No, go, go ahead. ahead. I'll come in after she after you get everybody. Any other public comments? All right. Uh, Larry. Uh, yes. Get me, get me <laughs> working here somehow. Where am I? There, got it. Um, you, she just brought up the discussion of the La Lima project, I think, and then people, and we had heard that some time ago and denied it. And they asked to meet with me, and I want to confess that I did meet with them privately and discussed uh, uh, what could be done to sort of pull things back together again because it, it got kind of out of control, I think, a little bit at the meeting because they hadn't uh, had any workshops with us or discussed the project or the, the issues. And so uh, all of us, including myself, were not prepared, I didn't think, to adequately uh, deal with the project. And so um, after meeting with them, I suggested to them that maybe what they needed to do was go back and kind of start over again and start workshops with staff and with various commissioners and different things and explain the situation and, and maybe it could be resolved and, and, and put back on the table and reconsidered at a later time. Uh, and so uh, I'm just bringing this up so staff is aware that I did talk to them about it. I didn't promise them anything other than 
I was sympathetic that I thought that we didn't, uh, we weren't really prepared for the project, I didn't think, as a board, because I know I wasn't. I hadn't been enlightened on it at all. So I think that uh, uh, it would be a, a probably the right thing to do is to give them a, a, a chance to retell their story and explain why they did, because I have to admit, we kind of shut them down at the hearing because we didn't much care for the numbers and so forth. And I think uh, they thought they had done everything right, but they had done it kind of uh, without going very public with it, I guess, is the problem, I'd have to say. And so I, I just want everyone to know that I did I did have a very brief meeting with them, uh, and, and they wanted to know what they should do. And I said, I think you should start out by coming back to staff and and uh, explaining, you know, what you would like to do and, and maybe get a better presentation going than the one that you gave us at, at that time and see if we can't uh, pull both ends to the middle and make it work because uh, they're, uh, they're just going to walk away from the project if we can't, if they can't find a middle ground or have it, uh, brought forward and so uh, I'm not suggesting that we approve it but I guess all I'm suggesting is we give them another bite at the apple and let them see if they if they can uh, with a workshop first maybe and explain the project better uh, to the commission and and then move on from that and so I just wanted the staff and and you guys aware that that I had offered I had suggested that this be a a, a route to solve their dilemma because uh, it's a it's a very uh, noticeable piece of property, and if they just walk on it, we're going to have a blight in the community forever. So I'd like to find some middle ground and let them uh, have a have a chance to convince us why they brought forward what they did. And so, well, we had asked them to meet with the community, and uh, aside from you, do you know if they've met with any of the community? To try to find some middle ground well it, it, that should be part of the process that they should uh, try to bring back go to the community to explain why they did what they did and because they are i'll have to confess they are trapped a little bit between uh what you would think you'd want to put there and what trp a lot of them do and and, they, and they've got some property line problems and other things that we kind of sailed over and didn't really take into consideration so I guess what I'm telling you is I have encouraged them to come back to the county and and try to get another bite at the apple I don't know how the best way to do it is but staff can lead them in that that area and and uh, rather than just have that property just stay in the condition it's in that maybe there's some middle ground we can maybe we could ask legal counsel to come in on this Yep, certainly. Uh, the applicant is more than welcome to come back to the commission. The last time that was heard, I believe it was continued to an open date and time. So it wasn't rejected. So they they are certainly more than welcome to come back. Um, I believe there was uh, commission uh, direction about doing more public outreach. And I, th I think that that would be a, probably a good suggestion for them. But they are they are certainly welcome to come back and not prevented by any means from doing so. I think it would be helpful if they came when they came back to us, it came back in the form of a workshop. And so we can kind of massage the project a little bit, maybe, and then uh, they can bring it back at a later time for a approval or denial. So. The item was continued, and I, I think it is still permissible to do a workshop as long as the, in in the interim, as long as it does come back. That um, is what the applicant is desiring to do. So, okay. Well, they'll probably be calling me momentarily. <laughs> And so I'm just going to tell them to contact staff and, and tell them that uh, staff said probably we could work something out. To, Certainly to, they can contact me directly and we can set that up. I'm sorry? They can contact me directly. Okay, I'll yep. tell them. Okay, thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. All right. Sorry for the interruption. <laughs> Not a problem. Uh, next Next on the agenda is the uh, consent items. Uh, do we need to take a separate action to postpone the uh, 6731 Tahoe project, since there's a request to uh, take so that off? Technically, uh, 
this would be the time under the consent agenda where someone would pull it off, but somebody has indicated in public comment they'd like to pull it off. I think that's probably sufficient to then pull it off the consent calendar um, and then uh, hear that item individually. <coughs> and do what? And then hear that item individually. Okay. Well, so, since C, uh, and then on, instead, just so you know, staff is going to be requesting to pull off the same item C uh, to continue the matter as well. So, which item is that? It's, uh, same uh, sixty-seven thirty-one Tahoe okay. item C. So the same one. Okay. So, uh, chair, for purposes of the consent calendar, you would still go forward with items A and B on the consent agenda. Okay. Um, and I'm, then after that's concluded, then you would hear item C. All right. I uh, move approval of items, uh, our consent items A and B. Second. We have a first and second uh, to approval, approve item A and B. Actually, I, just before we do that, um, we should open it up to public comment to see if anyone else wants to pull anything else from consent. All right. Uh, is there anyone in the public who would like to pull anything else from the consent calendar? Seeing none. Uh, we have a motion uh, and a second. I have a first from Mr. Nader, a second from Mr. Cannon. Uh, a vote from Mr. Cannon, please. Yes. Mr. Herzog. Abstain. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Nader. Yes. Mr. Hauge. Yes. Mr. Sevison. Yes. Mr. Moss. Yes. Thank you. All right. So now we have a separate item on uh, uh, item C, which is the 6731 Tahoe. Uh, also known as the Vision at Tahoe, uh, requesting, requesting um, that it be pulled from the agenda. Yes, thank you, uh, Chairman. So uh, this item, 6731 Tahoe, uh, there has been a change in ownership on the property, and so the legal notice and application for the extension of time uh, does not have that uh, required signature from the new owner. And I'm not sure what the new owner's intentions are with the property. So. Staff is asking that you continue this item to an open date. Uh, there would be no presentation on this item today, but of course you could accept uh, you know, comments on this continuance matter. All right. Are there any public comments on um, this item? 6731 Tahoe, the vision at Tahoe, extension of uh, tentative map. We have one up. Hi, good morning again, uh, Ellie Waller for the record. I completely understand the development has newly changed hands. I'd like to understand the reasoning behind a three year extension being requested. I understand one year is probably not enough in the Tahoe environment for a new project. Uh, two probably should be sufficient, but I'd like to understand the uh, planning commission's reasoning on why three is necessary. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, uh, this project originally, Tone Apollo was approved in 2003. It did change hands. Uh, new owner for what they're calling the Visions of Tahoe under Mr. Clapper, who has had one extension. And I want to thank the Planning Commission again. Uh, last extension, I asked that the demolition of the property, the blight, the bear problems, the vagrant problems be taken care of. And that was done at the last extension. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a response from the staff? So, yeah, so this, I believe this is the project's uh, third request for an extension of time, but this particular uh, request is for two years. All right. We have another comment? No. My name is Ralph Newland. Uh, we have a property on Highwood. Right? Uh, the property is on Excuse me, can we get your mic turned on? Would you mic oh, there? There you go, you're good now. <laughs> okay. You're on. <laughs> okay. Um, I also have a uh, question about the extensions that have been granted on this project. Um, we have been extending this thing uh, at least since 2012. And I, until yesterday, did not understand why they had to be extended. Um, I was here last year and missed my opportunity to have a public comment because I didn't know when to public comment. So um, I understand now that there was lack of money on the previous owner. There is a new owner. I, I 
can they can understand why that explains why there has been a delay in the start of this project but it just begged the question about how many problems is this project having that it can't get underway and if we do have new owners do we need to go back in the planning uh, process on this thing and see where they are and what they want to do, if they want to make any changes, if they're just going to stay the same. Um, the project itself, to me, is um, kind of worrisome. I have uh, concerns about some of the uh, fencing and some of the other things that are being going on uh, or that are projected to go on. If there is any concern on your part about how this project should concern, could proceed, then I would like to hear that at this time. But um, I just want to go on record as saying that I can not understand why so many extensions have to be granted. And if there is an extension, why it has to be two years, why can't it just be one? because that's what was granted last time. Thank you. Thank you. I assume the applicant asked for two years and that's what it... Um, any other public comments? Um, good morning, my name is Marty Decker. I'm also a property owner that's adjacent to the property in question for the uh, for the extension of time. Mine isn't so much what is going there. The properties, there are three properties that actually are between Idlewood and this project. They sit down inside the hill. And we have one lot that we would like to develop for a property, but we're having difficulty with the fire department because they said there's not adequate room to turn around down there. So I was hoping to see a site plan to see what they have in mind to allow emergency vehicles to be able to access that property from, from the south side. You know, if there was some sort of emergency lane that could be adopted into that plan. It's my biggest thing because I would hate to have those properties down there not to be serviced by the fire department in, in the case that there is, you know, an emergency that took place. So I would like to be able to discuss this with the with the person that is developing, um, also with the site plan, with the planning department, make sure that they're not limiting uh, the property owners from emergency vehicles accessing their property. See that nice lady sitting behind you there? She <laughs> can probably keep you well informed. <laughs> yes, we've already talked. <laughs> so anyway, that's all I had to ask about that. All right, thank you. Any other comments? If so, the public comment period uh, is closed on this and I guess it's appropriate for the commission to make a motion then to uh, extend this to a uh, time uncertain. Yeah, okay. so the request is to uh, continue it to an open date. And just for the public's purpose, uh, the new owner would be required to file a new extension of time application prior to the entitlement expiration date, which is uh, late February. Uh, so as long as they have an extension of time filed by that time, then we would re-notice it and have another uh, public hearing if they decide to continue with this project. All right, thank you. Okay, okay we have a motion. Oh, yeah. yeah. You have a question? Well, I think uh, the gentleman that was questioning the number of uh, extensions, I think, you know, he probably deserves an explanation of why this is appropriate now. Okay. Uh, EJ, can you... Or. So uh, under the county code, they're allowed a total of six years of extensions on the map and the permit. Um, every time they come in for an extension, they must uh, uh, make certain findings, which uh, the commission must make certain findings and the applicant must show. And some, one of those findings is includes uh, diligence in pursuing the project forward. So every time an extension is reviewed, the commission makes a finding or determines whether or not that diligence has occurred. Um, so when it comes back for, before you, you can look at the substance of the request and see whether they have been diligent in pursuing things and whether or not the commission is interested in granting another extension. 
is the uh, state. Uh, the state also gave some additional time. Uh, so is that on top of the six years? Right. If, if the state legislature provides an extension, then that is in addition to the six years that is authorized by the county code. And how much did they extend? That was obviously coming out of the Great Recession. You know, it depends on the legislature, and I don't. Um, it, I think there's dif different requirements for each of the extensions. Um, so I guess I can't say right off. It's seven years of state legislature extensions, but there was a good amount of them um, going back. I think yeah, five to ten years ago because of the economy. Correct. Right. Any other discussion on the part of the commission? Uh, we have a motion uh, to um, approve the extension uh, to a time uh, to be determined. Second. second. Well, we got two. Go ahead, give it to Mr. Cam. All right. So we have a second. The same. Larry was a uh, first. Okay. Very soft. I have a first by Larry Sevison, a second by Sam Cannon to continue the item to an open date and time. Could I have a vote from Mr. Cannon, please? Yes. Mr. Hersog? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Nader? Yes. Mr. Haugie? Yes. Mr. Sevison? Yes. Mr. Moss? Yes. Thank you. All right. At this time, uh, we're after 10.05, so uh, the next item on the agenda is Schaefer's Mill, General Plan Amendment, Rezoning, Major Subdivision Modification, Conditional Use Permit Modification, Addendum to Previously Certified Environmental Impact Report, um, and this had been continued from the December 5th meeting. So the staff. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Cha new, newly appointed chairman and fellow planning commissioners. I'm Stacy Wydra, and I'm here to present to you um, all the entitlements that the chairman just, just listed, so I won't go over those again. Uh, to get you quickly oriented as to where the project site is located, it is in the Martis Valley area in the Tahoe region. Um, it's about 0.4 miles south of the Nevada County line. And this is a new thing, I guess. So um, the Nevada County line is right in here. Um, and also, it's the Nevada County, Placer County line, and also the town of Truckee is located in here as well. And the project site is accessed off of Schaefer's Mill Road, which is right in here. And um, the project site off of Schaefer's Mill Road is accessed by 267. So to give you a little bit of background of this project, it has been around and was approved in 2004, where it was formally approved and known as Eaglewood. Then the name later changed to Timalik, and then later changed with the current owners to Schaefer's Mill. So perhaps you've maybe known it as many different subdivisions, but um, today's subdivision will be named as Schaefer's Mill. Uh, the 2004 approvals consisted of a vesting tentative map, a conditional use permit for a 462-unit planned residential development, which consisted of a blend of single-family residential lots and townhome lots, and also there was a requirement for affordable housing. And also with the planned residential development, um, the, the residential units were designed around an 18-hole golf course and its associated and accessory uses together with a clubhouse, maintenance facility, trails, and all of which was reviewed and evaluated through an environmental impact report, which was certified in 2004 by the Board of Supervisors. Since then, and over the course of the development of the project, there has been some substantial conformances um, that the planning director has been able to make, um, just minor tweaks and changes to the overall approved um, development of the, of the project site. So to date, there are 328 lots recorded, um, and uniquely, the one phase, so phase 2C, and I will show you a slide to that effect here in a minute, um, but there was a reduction in the, in the design. So originally, it was approved for 28 townhome lots, and due to the economy at that time, the owners asked that it be reduced to 14 single-family lots. And then similarly with phase 3B, when they designed that phase, they realized that the lots were just too narrow, and so they eliminated one lot um, to readjust and get all of those lots in there in, a, in a, a better workable size. So as such, there are 15 lots that essentially 
the applicants came to the county in 2017 and asked if they could bank those units, um, so to speak. And so that banking was recognized through this Schaefer's Mill lot agreement in 2017, which is an agreement between the county and the owners, which is New Martis Partners. And that agreement acknowledged that those 15 lots removed from those two phases that I just mentioned could be allocated um, through different phases of the lot, provided that it complies with the required zoning beneath it, um, access, and so forth. So this is the approved vesting tentative map. Um, just to get you quickly oriented of everything I, I just spoke of, um, you can see the residential lots and then the golf course um, of which those lots surround. So the project proposal before you today consists of two components. One component is to relate, relocate eight of those <coughs> residential lots of the 15 that I just spoke of, and then also relocate lot F, which is the maintenance and operations facilities. So I'm going to dive into the first component, which is the, eight, uh, re the relocation of the eight residential lots. And um, that is shown here in this circle. And um, so as I mentioned in, with the lot agreement, um, this, this slide shows where those lots came from. So phase 2C, which is shown right here, um, they were originally more narrow lots similar to this. And so this is where they converted the 28 townhome lots to the 14 lots, resulting in 14 lots remaining, and then lot or excuse me, phase 2B, um, which is lot G, or G court, excuse me. Um, they just readjusted some of these lot sizes and resulted in one lot remaining. So those are where the lots are coming from, and then this is where the lots are proposed. So as mentioned, the relocated residential lots require a general plan amendment, and the current designation for where the eight lots are located, which is located right in here, um, is forest with the 40 to 60 acre minimum. The proposed is a low density residential, one to five dwelling units per acre, which is exactly the same as the zoning located directly across the street, of which um, it is proposed to be constructed across Casey, from. Casey, could yes. you go back to the previous slide? Yes. So it shows in yellow that's where the lots are coming from? No. So the, this area right in here was originally 28 townhome lots. And when they, at that time, when they were developing phase 2C, the economy really was more geared towards single family lots. So what they did is they took the 28 townhomes configurations and made them into 14 lots. Um, and then just eliminated one lot out of the 15 lots that were slated in this area and in this phase, um, one lot came out as they adjusted the lot lines in there. So, so this adjustment is when they come in for that phase and then they're proposing their improvement plans and final map, that's when these came about. And so the developer realized this isn't working and so they wanted to slightly redesign what was approved from the original. And it's important to note that with, with these redesigns, the number of units still remains within the 462 units that was approved in 2004. So they have not exceeded the 462 units. Okay, so the eight new lots, what are they replacing? I'm sorry? Yeah, I, the math is way above my head. <sighs> Okay, so, so what are they replacing with the eight new lots? What are they? Um, so they're taking, I guess we could just say they're taking eight of the 14 that were, they're, they're taking eight of the 14 lots that were banked and putting them over to here. Okay, the banked ones are part of the 28. Is that right? Um, 
Well, they went from 28 to 14, okay. so the remaining balance is 14 lots. Okay, and so then they added a lot. That's different. No, and then they and then similarly they removed one lot in this area. So now they have a bank of 15 lots. So eight of those 15 lots that are banked are going right here. <clears throat> Okay, and so left. Yeah. some lots that are floating out in space. I'm sorry. All right, I'm sorry. Are, are there, so you have uh, seven, seven, seven remaining floating lots? Correct, okay. correct. And so those are just gone, right? No, no. no. I'll, I'll explain that with the, the lot agreement coming up. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll be patient. Are you good? Me. Okay, as long as you're clear. Um, okay. Um, Who's in first? Yeah. So, <laughs> so, um, so the general plan amendment um, again, forest to residential, and then also a rezone, which um, the existing zoning designation is open space, and the pro pro proposed um, is residential single family. Um, again, similar to the adjoining parcels that are located across um, Tarn Circle. So the relocated residential lots um, will be required to comply with all the development standards, um, in, including setbacks, height, lot coverage, and open space. And it's important to note that the open space requirement for this planned residential development is 20%. And with the coverages proposed for the eight uh, residential relocated lots, um, reduces it by 1%. So they're going from 61% open space to 60%. So still in compliance. So they approved this, again, they approved vesting tentative map. Um, and now I'm going to move on to the lot F location. And um, in this slide, it shows where the original lot F was located and then where it's being proposed to um, more of a less centrally located um, location of the overall subdivision, which would have required a very extensive roadway into and provide access to this um, lot, lot F, the maintenance and operations facility. So um, unlike the eight residential lots, the lot F complies with the general plan designation of open space. So it's moving from a designation of open space to a designation of open space, as well as the zoning, and same zoning open space to open space. So the only two entitlements that are needed for the lot F is a vesting tentative map modification and a conditional use permit modification. This is a conceptual site plan of the lot F maintenance and operations facilities. Um, if the project is approved, this, this site and design will have to also apply for a design review application of which that will review all the setbacks, heights, landscaping, lighting, all potential impacts that could be associated with the building and its design and its development. So as I mentioned, um, with the Eaglewood project in 2004, um, an EIR was certified with that project and its approvals. And um, when a, a project comes before us um, for uh, an, a, a modification, we look at um, the previous environmental document and um, we considered if an addendum could be the appropriate document for this project. An addendum is appropriate when there is, a, as I mentioned, a previously certified EIR. Um, changes or revisions to the project are proposed, and that circumstances surrounding the project may have changed, but none of the changes or revisions would result in significant or, or highly substantial or more severe environmental impacts. The project did go through environmental review for these two components that I have spoke of, and it was concluded that there were no new significant impacts um, generated as a result of these two components. Um, and that the findings of the original certified EIR continue to remain valid and that the addendum is the appropriate document to move forward for its environmental <coughs> review. And furthermore, the, the, our um, environmental consultants assent, environmental, are here today. Um, and also the addendum did go through um, a lot of 
a lot of, all the impacts, including noise and traffic and visibility. So, um, and those again were concluded that um, the the mitigation measures contained within the original EIR are still sufficient to address the potential impacts with the proposed project today. We did receive correspondence on this project, um, and one of them was primarily about affo affordable housing. And so I'd like to just quickly um, inform you of where we are at with the affordable housing component of this project. Um, while it is not part of this project, um, it is located on a lot, lot A uh, within this subdivision. It's actually north of lot F. And so in similarly to that 2017 lot agreement that was done between the county and the owners, we, they also created a, a 2017 workforce housing agreement. And within that agreement, the original condition spelled out 48 affordable employee units and eight moderate townhomes. Through that agreement, the county and the, the owners agreed that we would eliminate the, the two differences and just lump them all as 56 total affordable employee units. And so since that 2017 agreement, the applicants have been working forward um, in getting this, this project site developed. And in that, they have recorded the final map for lot A, so it is now a legal developable, par developable parcel. Um, a design review application for the design of the affordable housing buildings and structures has been approved. Improvement plans, grading plans, um, so basically the construction of the on-site infrastructure and utilities and road improvements um, is in-house and under <coughs> review with staff. And similarly, building permits were just submitted as well, so those are being um, reviewed and will be submitted as soon as they are ready and comply with the code and is anticipated that um, the construction will commence in June, July in 2020 and essentially begin, you know, break ground at that time. We also received um, comments from the Truckee Tahoe Airport Land Use Commission that they determined that there would, no, there would be no inconsistencies with the relocation of the eight lots and lot F um, because this project site is within the aircraft overflight overlay district. And with that, uh, the Development Review Committee is requesting that the Planning Commission recommend approval of the following items to the Board of Supervisors. Adopt a resolution approving an addendum to the certified 2004 Eaglewood Final EIR and Mitigation Monitoring Reporting Program pursuant to CEQA as set forth in Attachment I and supported by the findings contained in the staff report. Also adopt a resolution to amend the Martis Valley Community Plan land use diagram from open space to residential, as shown in attachment G and supported by the findings contained in the staff report. Also adopt an ordinance to rezone the Schaefer's Mill project site, as shown in attachment H and supported again by the findings and within the staff report. And also approve the Schaefer's Mill vesting tentative subdivision modification, as shown in attachment C subject to the modified conditions of approval, attachment J, and supported by the findings contained in the staff report. Approve the conditional use permit modification for the Schaefer's Mill planned residential development, subject to also the modified conditions and supported by the findings contained in the staff report. So with that, that concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to address any questions. Uh, commissioners, you have questions of... Uh, well, did I miss the seven mystery lots? So the seven lots um, are are they they have not allocated where they're going to put those yet. Okay. I'm sorry. They are done, and they were done through the substantial conformances. Um, if you want to, I can go back to a site plan. I'm sorry, Wally. You are right. It's a big subdivision, and I. <laughs> um, so let's, Wally. Would this site plan look? Uh, would that help you? Or the. Oh, you know what? This one's probably better. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, okay. So this, may I introduce Wally? He's the um, applicant, and he can help address that question. Thank you. Yes. Thanks, Stacy. Uh, for the record, Wally Auerbach, Auerbach Engineering, on behalf of New Martis Partners. I really didn't have a presentation to make today, but I, I thought I'd help clarify where the lots came from and went to. Um, 
the uh, Stacy was correct that in the blue area up there we converted 28 townhomes to 14 single-family lots so there's 14 lots right away that we've set aside and in the yellow area we converted 15 lots to 14 so we set aside another lot so there's 15 total lots eight of which we're trying to relocate within the development and that's the subject of the application today the other seven lots were all addressed through um, substantial conformance findings and they were basically scattered throughout uh, the development within the development boundaries so as you know the planning director can look at a uh, proposed subdivision and say well that's substantially in accordance with the previously approved tentative map so we'll allow it to move forward forward without any additional findings and that's where the seven lots went to so they're all, all already uh, I'm thinking they, they are all already mapped so there's no more floating lots if no this more, decision is made okay. no more floating lots but <laughs> right. uh, uh, anyway and frankly to be honest with you we were making the argument very strongly early on that all 15 lots could fall into that same sort of finding that substantial conformance finding um, Stacy, could you go to the zoning? Um, I don't know how to use this. Go. The zoning map. Nope. Uh, the one that we prepared with the eight lots shown on the side. Oh, yeah. There it is. Yeah. So we had prepared this map showing where those eight lots would be located relative to the existing development and uh, the zoning boundaries. And I'm sure you've been faced over the years with lots of discussions and debate about how a zoning line got to be where it is. And we tried to de uh, describe it here, that solid line that cuts through those uh, lots. And, you know, our best estimate is that's where the zoning line was drawn. And, of course, when you go from big fat felt pens back in the day to CAD files now, there's, you're never going to agree on where the zoning lines are. In any case, our point was that those eight lots don't create any uh, additional impact outside the zoned boundary for residential uh, that we didn't already anticipate. We, we argued that point for a long time and uh, finally decided to go ahead with the project application for the eight lots. And as you see, the environmental uh, work that was done, all the boxes <laughs> were checked, no, no, no. There is no additional impact. So uh, we did the right thing. Went through the process, checked all the boxes, but frankly, we thought that those lots could have been moved there with a director's determination. Okay. And Thank you. Mr. Yes. Sefferson has a question. Oh, I just, one question. The blue line that goes through the front of the yellow lots, would that be moved out behind the yellow lots now? Is that the idea so it becomes part of the project? Correct. And actually, the, the point of this particular exhibit was if you can see the blue line along the south edge of the drawing, that's actually drawn outside the, the residentially zoned right. area. So we were hoping, we were arguing, why don't we just swap that for what we want on the lots, okay. and it would be a net increase in open space overall if we just made that decision at the director's level. But that, okay. that got to be more complicated, and we went through the process. All right. Yeah. Uh, Wally, on those seven now not floating lots, are those now being uh, looked at as uh, single family residential units? Uh, no, four were replaced as townhomes. Okay. And three were um, integrated into the last phase of single family development, which is on the left there, phase 3C. So they're single family lots, custom lots. All right. As Stacy said, most of the comments we've got are around the affordable housing right. issue. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about that? As, uh, this project hopefully is moving forward on that. I'm I'm happy to. Um, I, I th as I think staff expressed that um, the affordable housing um, component of the project was actually it's actually subject to an agreement between the developer and uh, the county. Um, there's commitments on both sides. The developer, New Martis Partners, has um, uh, complied in spades with everything he's been asked to do as part of that development or as part of that agreement. The project as it stands today is the new, uh, Neighborhood Partners, LLC, I think uh, you're familiar with them. They are an affordable housing developer. The land has been subdivided 
passed on to ownership by neighborhood partners. Uh, they have um, applied for and obtained uh, state and federal tax credits and private loans to the tune, I think, of some $30 million. I don't have the number exactly. Maybe Shauna does. But um, <clears throat> they have engaged architects and engineers uh, to design the project. Uh, application is submitted. I think it's pretty close to being ready for issuance of a grading permit on site uh, to begin the mass grading of the property. Um, applications were submitted for a building permit before the end of the year. They're now in plan check. And the developer, new, um, uh, neighborhood partners, has every intention of breaking ground this year. That's the plan. And um, I think if the uh, if John Marlin, uh, the developer at New Martis Partners, were standing here today, he'd be very animated expressing to you how much he has done to help move this project forward and get it to where it is. Um, he is all about getting, the, getting this done, building affordable housing. As a matter of fact, out of all the eastern Placer County developments, I think we might be the only ones who have actually gotten to on-site affordable housing ready to construct. And that's right now. That's way ahead of... Were you moving into it yourself? Or is it no. <laughs> <laughs> I might have to if we don't get this approved. I don't know. <laughs> no. Oh, well, Wally, uh, it sounds like the timing. We're going to start to see some sticks come moving up uh, pretty quickly here. Now, is that all the units are going to happen yes. at the same time? All 56 okay. units will happen at the same time. So that will all happen this year, likely. Yeah, you know, is there still a little bit of risk? Sure, we've still got to get bids. You know, right. the project has to get bids that uh, make it feasible to construct within the budget. Um, that process is going to be starting very soon. Um, uh, however, regardless, we are still in compliance with the Workforce Housing Agreement, which really doesn't require us to break ground until sometime next year in 2021. So um, we're ahead of schedule. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any if, other questions or comments from the commission? Okay. Yeah. Just, you, you will move that blue line in back to the outside edge so that it doesn't show up as bifurcating those lots when they come in for permits and stuff. He, yes. I think the, the documentation the county records on the zone change will actually move those boundaries. And uh, the Board of Soups, I assume, will have that when they... Sometimes those things cause a lot of problems later yeah, on if you don't get it done. You know, that's not a buildable site or whatever. And right. It's not fair. Right. All right. So um, I would like to come back in response to any comments from the public if necessary. I'll reserve that opportunity. Thank you. Okay. At this time, then, it's a time for public comment. Uh, comments are limited to three minutes each, and Sue will be timing those. Um, Ellie? We're not hearing you. On, okay. To speak on this um, subject, uh, I sent in extensive comments. I hope you board members were provided enough time by me to look at those. I did ask for some mitigation measures to also be updated. Um, I would like Stacy and or Wally to get up and show on a map where the affordables are going to be and the potential impacts that I brought up where mitigations would be need to change. And I'm also asking that you add an additional permit requirement that these affordables get built before those eight units get built. It's been 15 years. They've been granted um, extensions. They've changed the project. They have new owners. These affordables need to go on the ground. The buck should stop with you planning commissioners and make that happen. I know Wally said they're ahead of their agreement schedule for 2021, but it's time to bring this forward, get those 56 units on the ground, understand financial feasibility, understand they may not all get built, but some of those units need to go before those eight residential units. And again, um, I'm happy to go through my comments again. Um, I asked a couple other questions about uh, wildlife might be low hanging fruit, but uh, I'd like staff. I'm, they were provided my comments also, and it would be nice if some of those things were discussed. Thank you. Thank you. Are there, uh, oh, okay. 
Hi, good morning. Ann Nichols, North Dahl Preservation Alliance. This is a great opportunity for you guys to, you know, make affordable housing happen. In fact, this is the applications for the permits for it weren't done until a couple of weeks ago, which was, I think, in response to uh, public comments. So you can make this happen. And, you know, Shaver's Mill is doing great. Average sales price, couple, you know, I'm a realtor, a couple million bucks. They're doing, which I'm glad that they're doing great. But this, you know, what other kind of hammer do we have really than when they're asking to create new lots where there was once open space? And, you know, you probably look at it like, well, this isn't a big deal. But certainly I think would start the, the best precedent for getting this stuff happen. There's a lot of other developments that haven't done their affordable housing. I, I think Marta's camp hasn't either. So uh, please uh, do this for the community. It's it's really time and, and thank you for uh, making this kind of thing happen. Thank you. Other comments? If not, we'll close the public comment period. Uh, staff, do you have any responses? So I will. Right. <laughs> the new. <laughs> um, I know this is a hard map to read, um, but that is generally the. This is lot A. Um, actually, let me. So that is lot A, um, which demonstrates where the affordable housing um, approved location is. It was this again. This is the approved vesting ten tentative map, so it's always where it was slated for. Also, um, as I mentioned previously, lot A has been recorded, um, so that is a um, approved developable uh, developable lot. Um, and then with regards <coughs> to the. Um, uh, environmental impacts that was raised through public correspondence. Um, and, and our consultants are here who can go into more of those specifics. But with the addendum, all of the existing mitigation measures are reviewed and evaluated against the proposed project. And do they still meet the intent to mitigate whatever that potential significant impact could be? And so with that, all of those mitigation measures still sufficed to address the potential concerns um, and all of those. And I'm, I'm happy to go through each one of Ellie's comments, if you would like. Um, but it was found, and again, the, the consultants can go into greater detail of this, but that this, the mitigation measures um, didn't need to be modified to address the potential impacts, because the mitigation measure that was originally approved still met and mitigated it that potential impact to a less than significant level. All right. Members of the commission, any comment or questions? I, I guess, can, can you hear me okay, Stacy? How does the, how does the book work get done so that the, these requirements for uh, employee housing and low cost housing when do they dovetail in are they are they scheduled as part of the program or is it just we just have to wait until they get financing and so forth to make it happen yes yeah, so I can jump in on that so you know obviously the county has done extensive work on this uh, affordable housing project it's a high priority we have our both our housing specialists here today who can probably speak to it much better than me, uh, so I'll probably, Shauna, you want to take a shot at this? <laughs> so, good morning, Shauna Purvines. Um, we are ecstatic that this project is actually moving forward. Um, projects such as this take uh, multiple different types of funding sources to come together, so getting those stars to align sometimes, it does take us a little bit um, longer than we would even like. Um, this project specifically was awarded um, about $17 million in the new cap and trade uh, affordable housing fund uh, two years ago and is um, pending its one and final last piece of funding um, that is expected. It's an over the counter type of funding, so it's not something that is um, that we have to be concerned with um, next week. 
Um, and that is that last piece that we are uh, that puts this project to bed. Um, as I was mentioned, they've already been through the design process. Their permits are going through. Their improvement plans are being reviewed. Um, we have full expectations that this will break ground um, here, or at least get started uh, this summer. And um, the the county actually did this in partnership. The one of the benefits of that greenhouse gas and the cap and trade dollars that we are. Um, in is that it didn't only just build the site, it's actually going to do improvements off-site as well to our trails and to our bus and our transit. Um, so it's um, really advantageous to the community as a whole to get this project going. So albeit they um, they maybe did have a year more um, to meet their obligation, um, we were able to, to, to bring this forward with the funding sources that were made available for this project sooner than we expected. Thank you. Thank you. Sean. <laughs> uh, Wally sort of left kind of a question when I asked him about that at the end, but uh, you sound pretty confident this is going to happen and happen before the end of the year. Yeah, based on that, the, the funding source that I mentioned, um, it, there is timelines now established once we do receive those. So we absolutely expect it to happen. You have to perform, right, to Correct. get the funding. Right? Yep. And I think typically we usually ask that it's uh, as projects are developing and they have to do their affordable housing component of that, and they just do, they can do that in phases as the homes are as the other homes are built. But they're actually doing this. It sounds like all up front because it hasn't been complete. Their project hasn't been completely developed yet. But Correct, and they're doing it all in one what at one time as opposed right. to in phases. Yes. All right. Thank you. How many lots are developed, Wally? <laughs> Uh, excluding the affordable housing lots, there are uh, four, there were 406 residential lots approved as part of the subdivision. Uh, 328 of those have recorded, so about 80 percent. Okay. Thank you. Any other? Oh, did you want to respond to any of the questions that came up? Not really. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Wally Auerbach again. Um, I, I did just want to say, you know, the, for a couple of reasons, we would be um, reluctant to accept a condition that, you know, a further condition on the affordable housing as it relates to this project. One, this project doesn't create or affect affordable housing at all. This is just taking some lots and moving from one develop, portion of the development to another. And uh, as I said, there was a lot of uh, uh, sense, at least on our part, that that shouldn't have even risen to this level, but it did, and, and here we are. Uh, the other issue is we already have a workforce housing agreement in place that's rock solid. Uh, workforce housing is going to get built, and um, uh, we are in compliance with that agreement, and there's no reason to, to, to change any of those conditions. And lastly, and I think I already touched on this, you know, building workforce housing is really hard. <laughs> it takes a lot of time. Uh, it takes a lot of expertise and somebody else's money. Uh, typically, and at, at this point in time, while the developer can stand there and be a cheerleader to make sure he can do everything possible to make this happen, the actual project itself is in the hands of the experts and the funders and everybody else to, to get it done. Uh, he has limited control at this point of actually making sure that something breaks ground. Uh, neighborhood Partners has the, uh, they own the land, they've hired the architects and the engineers, they're processing the permits. They're getting the loans. It's kind of their baby. So uh, it, it's almost a separate issue at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Address the wildlife issue since this is now pushing just slightly outside of the boundaries that we were looking at before. I mean, do uh, you have any comment on that at all? You know, I, I would prefer to leave that to the environmental folks. Um, uh, as they did the analysis and, and made the findings on impacts and mitigations in that regard. Hi, my name is Jessica Mitchell. I represent, um, uh, I work with Ascent Environmental. Um, so in the addendum, we analyzed all of the um, topics that are typically covered in a CEQA document. 
and also covered in the original Eagle, Eaglewood EIR, which included addressing impacts related to wildlife. Um, one of the issues that was addressed in the original Eaglewood EIR was um, migratory pathways for wildlife, um, and in this area there is a deer, excuse me, deer migratory um, pathway, and um, we did look at this in the addendum checklist, and um, we, uh, we concluded that this wouldn't result in a new substantial, um, or sorry, significant impact related to wildlife movement in this area or um, substantially increase the severity of the environmental impact related to that. Um, uh, so the residential lots are going to be moved to an area that was originally identified as open space. Um, and we found that, I'm going to write on the screen because I saw Stacy doing it, so in, uh, you know, generally this area, and it's um, not to scale, <laughs> um, so there's still um, open space in this area, um, and I believe it's still about a 100-foot a buffer, which I think was, um, you know, required as, as part of the original um, Eaglewood EIR, so it doesn't substantially encroach into a wildlife movement corridor um, and the project, um, the changes to the project, the relocation of the residential units and Lot F are still subject to all of those mitigation measures that are included in the Eagle, Eaglewood EIR, which includes um, mitigation related to wildlife movement um, such that they are not allowed, residential lots um, are not allowed to construct perimeter fences around those lots to ensure that they're maintaining that open space. Yes. If there's no other questions, Chairman, I'll move. Yeah. Could you Stacy oh, just a minute, just a minute. Stacy, could you put oh, the recommendation question. back up, please? Hey. <coughs> Was it the same as our agenda? Yes. It might be shorter. <laughs> huh? This may be short. <laughs> okay. Uh I'll move do we adopt a resolution approving the addendum to the certified 2004 Edgewood Eaglewood FEIR and MMRP pursuant to CEQA as set forth in attachment one and supported by the findings contained in the staff report. And that's a recommendation to the board, correct? Yeah. Second. Yeah. Okay. And just to clarify, that's attachment I, not attachment one. Oh, okay. Attachment I. All right. What, what do you we, see? It's attachment I instead of one. Oh. Yeah. I can see I, I'm sorry. You should, it should have little things on the top and the bottom of it. <laughs> All right. Is there a second? I, I did. Okay. Nader, a second. I have a first from Mr. Sevison, a second from Mr. Nader. So vote for Mr. Cannon, please. Yes. Mr. Herzog? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. The girls. Mr. John, oh, okay, Mr. Nader? Yes. Mr. Haugie? Yes. Mr. Sevison? Yes. Mr. Moss? Yes. Thank you. I further move to adopt a resolution to amend the MVCP land use diagram from open space to residential as shown in the attachment G and supported by the findings contained in the staff report. Second. I have a first and a second. First from Mr. Sevison, a second from Mr. Nader. A vote for Mr. Cannon, please. Yes. Mr. Herzog? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Nader? Yes. Mr. Haugie? Yes. Mr. Sevison? Yes. Mr. Moss? Yes. Thank you. I further move that we adopt an ordinance to rezone the Schaefer's Mill project site as shown in attachment H and supported by the findings contained in the staff report. Second. I have a motion and a second. First from Mr. Sevison, a second from Mr. Nader. A vote from Mr. Cannon. Yes. Mr. Herzog. Yes. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Nader. Yes. Mr. Haugie. Yes. Mr. Sevison. Yes. Mr. Moss. Yes. Thank you. And number four, approve the Shapers Mills vesting tentative map subdivision modification, <clears throat> excuse me, as shown in attachment C, subject to the modified conditions of approval 
Attachment J and supported by the findings contained in the staff report. Second. I have a first and a second. The first from Mr. <laughs> Sevison, a second from Mr. Nader. A vote from Mr. Cannon, please. Yes. I'll do it after the vote. Mr. Hersock? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Nader? Yes. Mr. Hauge? Yes. Mr. Sevison? Yes. Mr. Moss? Yes. Thank you. And just to clarify for purposes of the record, and I know it says it in the staff report, these are all recommendations to the Board of Supervisors. To the board. Correct. Correct. No. Further recommend approval to the Board of that we approve the conditional use permit modifications for the Schaefer's Mill plan residential development. Subject to the modified conditions of the approval found in attachment J and supported by the findings contained in the staff report. Second. I have a first and a second. First from Mr. Sevison, a second from Mr. Nader. A vote from Mr. Cannon, please. <clears throat> yes. Mr. Herzog? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Nader? Yes. Mr. Hauke? Yes. Mr. Sevison? Yes. Mr. Moss? Yes. Thank you. All right. That's all. That is everything. <laughs> all right. Uh, next on the agenda, and we're past 1020, uh, is the AT&T cell tower appeal of the zoning administrator's denial of a minor use permit, category exemption, uh, staff report. Oh, should we take a break? Yeah. yeah how, about, how about we take just a five-minute break? and then we'll come back. Okay. okay. Yes, one, two, two. Uh, Mike kind of going wild here. Yeah, I don't know. Get a lot of feedback there. there. A lot of them are going straight up. So, check one, two, two. Yes, one, two, two. Locked out there, huh? I mean, I never.
let's call the meeting back to order and time for the staff report on the AT&T cell tower. Uh, first, I want to mention to uh, those in the audience, there is a sign-up sheet for comments. So if you uh, make sure your name is on the sign-up sheet, and then EJ or Kara will call out the names uh, for the public uh, testimony. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. I am Bennett Smithart with the Planning Services Division. Our next item today is an appeal uh, from Jared Kersley with Epic Wireless on behalf of at and of the Zoning Administrator's denial of a minor use permit for a new 88-foot-tall cellular communications tower within a 1,184-square-foot fence compound. This is in the Ofer area. The tower is proposed at 545 Miller Town Road in Auburn, which is about 1,000 yards north of um, Interstate 80 and about 300 yards north of the Auburn wastewater plant. The 6.3-acre <clears throat> the residential parcel is developed with a single-family dwelling and accessory structures. It is zoned residential agriculture combining minimum building site of 100,000 square feet and is designated a rural residential 2.3 to 4.6 acres minimum in the OFER general plan. The applicant is requesting approval of a minor use permit for an 88-foot tall cellular communications tower, as I mentioned before, at 545 Millertown Road. The tower is proposed centrally on the parcel and would be disguised as a tree. I have, uh, this is the zoom in to the right, the, uh, the red box is the location of the fence compound, and inside of it, this is a cellular tower, so it's basically centrally located. Um, the tower will include uh, infrastructure for cellular, broadband internet, and first net. So first net is a um, dedicated cellular communications for first responders, um, so when firefighters or police officers are out, uh, they won't have to rely on a potentially busy cell cellular tower. Uh, they have their dedicated tower, so they are, they're able to do what they need to do. Um, and this proposal is a part of the Connect America Fund. Uh, the Connect America Fund is a federal program uh, to promote broadband in um, rural areas or areas that do not have broadband. Uh, so uh, basically with a cell tower, they it'll, it'll be like a satellite on it, and the Folks that live near it will be able to point their satellite to it and get uh, high-speed internet. Um, right now, it's not really high-speed what they have out there. The 88-foot height includes 83 feet of tower with 5 feet of foliage on top. The cellular monopole top tower is within a 1,184 fence compound, and this will be 6-foot redwood fence. Um, the cellular tower will have 12 antennas, of 4 per sector, 4 surge suppressors, and 24 remote radio units. Within the fence compound will be a brown walk-in equipment cabinet with a pitched residential-like roof. This is just to blend into the residential community. And a 30-kilowatt diesel generator with a 190-gallon fuel tank and a noise shield. In addition, trench fiber optic cables and electric cables will be installed from site from Millertown Road. Uh, the applicant gave us renderings of the proposed cell tower, um, just to kind of describe the site. So as I said earlier, it's uh, 6.3 acres, um, and it kind of gently, the topography gently increases to the north. The north side uh, has more um, old growth trees, and there's more of a, a, a canopy of trees. The south side of the site is more grasslands and fragmented trees. Um, so just with the specific views, some are more visible than other of the cell tower. Um, I have three, one on the next slide of the visual simulations. Uh, the one on the left here is from the inter close to the intersection of Miller Town and Wise Road, just north of that. That's looking into the property um, from the east side. Um, and so you'll see the cell tower there. The next on the right side is looking from the north east corner into the site. Um, and so that's the view of the cell tower from the northeast. The last one is, is this coming from the uh, uh, northwest side 
Um, and so this is from a property up there that uh, AT&T's representative took pictures of um, and simulated these pictures. So that's the view from there. Going to the uh, zoning administrator hearing. <coughs> Uh, the item first went to the September 19th zoning administrator hearing. Um, there were several, several individuals that spoke in opposition uh, to the tower. Um, public comment included visual impacts and community character uh, impacts on property values, uh, health and safety, traffic and site distance, and fire concerns. Um, at the hearing, or right after the hearing, the applicant offered to lower the height of the tower. It was originally proposed at 120 feet, and they got it down to 88 feet. And they will add, and they added, as we see today, the fence and the roof-like structure on the equipment cabinet. Uh, the ZA had some concerns about some of the items addressed, and he wanted to do some further research, so it was continued um, to an open date. Um, they were able to make it to the next hearing, the October 17th hearing. Received some additional uh, public comment. The public kind of elaborate on some of the, the uh, issues that I mentioned momentarily ago. Uh, we did have one individual sp speak in support of it. Uh, the applicant responded, saying the tower is compatible with the vicinity and pre presents no safety concerns. Uh, the the minor use permit was denied. The uh, zoning administrator could not make the finding that it was compatible with the surrounding community and environment. On October 28th, uh, we received an appeal um, from Epic Wireless on behalf of AT&T. Um, the appellant contends that the project is compliant with county code and is consistent with the surrounding neighborhood character. And AT&T's proposed facility complies with federal law and must be approved. The Federal Telecommunications Act of 1996 prohibits a local government from denying an application for a wireless facility where doing so would prohibit or have the effect of prohibiting the provision of personal wireless services. And lastly, the project opponents focus largely on health concerns relating to radio frequency emissions and speculation about the impact of property values. AT&T uh, applications cannot be rejected based on health concerns to the extent the proposed facility complies with the FCC standard, and that's talking about um, local and uh, state jurisdictions cannot deny it based solely on or based on the uh, emissions from towers. So therefore, uh, staff recommends to the Planning Commission to deny the appeal filed by the project applicant and uphold the Zoning Administrator's decision to deny the minor use permit supported by the findings stated in the staff report. Available for any questions. All right, commissioners, are there questions? <clears throat> See, uh, you mentioned all the things that are attached to the tower. Correct. That includes what other companies like Verizon and T Mobile and, and uh, law enforcement. I mean, who, what are all the accoutrements that go on this tower? Uh, so, so, the three main things I think AT&T could probably speak in more details about the specifics on there. But the three things. Three main things uh, that I heard was was cellular, so you know, AT and T cell phone uh, folks can have better service out there. The broadband internet, so people in this region, this area, can get better um, uh, internet at their homes on their computers, laptops, and things like that. And the um, and the first net, which is the the first responder dedicated uh, communications lines. I think cell phones, something like first responder cell phones. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Yeah, I think part of the rational, rationalization of why we should deny this is it doesn't meet the visual components of the environment. Can you speak more to why it doesn't fit the visual components of that environment? For the um, so, so it's just kind of um, basically we're just following the zoning administrator's recommendation on this one. And, and with the, all the information presented, he could not make finding that it was compatible. Uh, he didn't specifically go into aesthetics, but it was kind of part of the big picture of why he, he could not make the finding to approve it. Um, so, so with my review, um, um, I can see where the, the, the tower is larger in some of the surrounding trees, and there's some, some views where it's very visible, especially the east, 
uh, properties to the east of this property, there are some some vistas where it's, it's the cell tower is very so visible. Is it mainly the height? I, I, th I think there's a, a generally speaking, there's there's a, a lot. I think some people don't like the uh, the look of the cell tower, the height. I think there's uh, several aspects of the aesthetics argument that uh, people do not support. And if, if I could just jump in real quick, too. The staff report does talk at pages five and six about the aesthetic portion of it. Um, if you want to take a And also, just as a note for the for the chair, uh, since this is an appeal of the zoning administrator's hearing, um, after staff goes, then it, uh, we would open up uh, it to the appellant yep. to provide their portion and then do public comment and then bring it back to the commission. All right. You had a question? Um, the the federal laws that were were shown in the the presentation were saying that that we can't put certain conditions on and so forth is is that that's accurate? Sure. I can go into those in a little bit more detail. Um, federal Telecommunications Act of 1996 is what's cited, um, and that act says that there's nothing that limits the ability of local governments to make decisions regarding placement of facilities as long as they don't do a couple of things, and they list those out. One of those is the local agency can't unreasonably discriminate among providers of functionally equivalent services. The other one is that the local agency can't prohibit or has the effect of prohibiting the provision of per personal wireless services. Under that first element of unreasonably discriminate, uh, that means that um, some discrimination is allowed, but it must be reasonable and uh, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals has held in a case, Metro PCS for City of and County of San Francisco, that discrimination based on <coughs> traditional basis of zoning regulation, um, things such as preserving the character of the neighborhood, avoiding aesthetic blight, those are reasonable reasons to reject a application um, and are therefore permissible in terms of that discrimination tier. Uh, when you look at that second element, the, the one about prohibiting or has the effect of prohibiting the provision of personal wireless services, that's the one mentioned in the AT&T letter in the appeal. The inquiry into that is whether the local agency has a regulation prohibiting the provision of personal wire, wireless services um, and, or the agency runs a follow that provision if it imposes an agency-wide general ban or it imposes restrictions that amount to an effective prohibition. Here the county doesn't have a general ban, so you look to whether or not the county has done something that, to impose restrictions that amount to an effective prohibition. And when you look at that element, there's two questions. One, is there a significant gap in the provider service coverage? And two, um, the manner in which the provider proposes to fill that significant gap is that the least intrusive manner to do that? Um, so that's something that you'll be evaluating today is, one, is the provider provide evidence that there is a gap in their service? Um, and two, are they providing the kind of least intrusive method to do so? Um, if that is the case, then you would fall in that category of um, then needing to approve this. Um, but if neither one of those are shown if you don't believe there's substantial evidence to show either one of those components um, then you're not restricted and you can choose to decide however you would you would like to with respect to this application when it comes to radio frequency emissions this is also mess this is also mentioned in the appeal the federal telecommunications act of 1996 does prevent the county from determining this matter on the basis of environmental effects of radio frequency emissions if the facility complies with the FCC's regulations concerning those emissions. Um, and AT&T has submitted a radio frequency emissions compliance report that indicates this facility will operate within applicable FCC exposure limits. Um, and such statements about environmental effects and those emissions, if you hear them in public comment, those can't be considered in your decisions as long as that FCC requirement is met, um, which AT&T is indicating it is met. So. So those are the, uh, the constraints, and I, I can fill you in more on those kind of afterwards if you have further questions. Too. I think that answered mine. Thank you. Okay. Same. Ben, and I have a question. In the volume of letters that were sent in objection, 
Maybe you could speak to for just a moment uh, the one from Arthur Olson in Auburn, where he na lays out 18 different points of problems with the uh, presentation and the analysis. Uh, yes. Um, so, so we did review. There was one, um, and this is one from a few months ago, correct? Um, so there was uh, quite a few, a few items uh, that there were concerns with. It was um, they got to the point like font size and things like that, and they're kind of smaller, more details that we don't typically get into the um, planning commission zoning uh, administrator level. Um, so it's a little more detailed than we get. We're kind of looking at big picture. Is this a land use compatibility issue, or you know, do we need to change the font on detailing on a, on that? So so most of those were. We're like that, and we did work with them to try to resolve most, or if not all, of those. So you'd agree that those are minutia, and and as far as uh, uh, critical points, then correct. Not really relevant to the land use aspect of it. it that's how I interpreted it. Yes, correct. Or rather, how I interpreted your answer and the and the uh, the admit the um, the county's involvement from their perspective. Yes. Thanks for answering that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Our, our uh, uh, cell tower is normally exempt from CEQA evaluation? Uh, no, they are not exempt as, as a whole. So this one, at least I don't think I saw uh, that uh, behavior. Or anything and here. Yeah, I can jump in on that one. Um, so if uh, in the event that the commission were to look at approving this um, project, staff would need to come back with findings supporting that approval which would also include a CEQA exemption or um, some sort of environmental clearance. Uh, right now, staff is recommending a, um, the upholding of the zoning administrator's denial. And so the environmental clearance for this is rejection of a project, which is listed as an exemption in the staff report. So if uh, the Planning Commission ultimately decides that it would like to uh, approve this project, then staff would need to come back with findings supporting that. Um, included and then would also need to look in the environmental portion of it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Other comments? Uh, I have some, and I, I want to put put this into perspective a bit. Um, I had the opportunity uh, to visit Paradise with the battalion chief who was on site during the Paradise fire, and there were deaths because the cell service didn't work. Uh, one of the recommendations definitely is the first net. <clears throat> Uh, in order to provide that open line for the first responders. Uh, one of the things they noted that the number of the cell towers went down, not because a cell tower burnt, but because the power to those towers went down. So the other recommendation is that you need uh, backup power for the cell, the cell tower. So looking at that and, and looking at uh, safety, you know, cell towers are important. So. One of the things I'm looking at is I looked at the findings. I didn't find them really clear as to why it's being denied. So what I'd like to know is you could apply those anywhere in the county. So where are cell towers allowed given these kind of findings? Uh, so, so cell towers, according to our zone, you need a minor use permit uh, for that. I don't have the specific code right in front of me, but it's um, um, from my memory, um, it's, it's just a minor use permit. It, it's, it's fairly open in terms of where it can go throughout the county as long as it has that minor use permit review. The problem I see here is, you know, is, is recommended for denial. I don't see a real specific reason for the denial in the findings as far as what I would like to see. And uh, it's here. Yes. Okay. So that's what I'm asking is what's that? Understood, but I, I wanted to, to share this because as a public speak, as the applicant speaks, then they can address some of these issues is what I'm looking for. So, um, you know, maybe what we do is come back and have that discussion about exactly how we're denying and, and where they're approved because it goes back to uh, it was a very uh, humbling and sobering experience to hear firsthand, moment to moment, what happened during Paradise uh, and how the cell towers that were working uh, were critical to the safety. So, okay. so one of the things definitely when the applicant comes up, what's the coverage? How many more cell towers are required to? Re if this one is not built, where do they go? Uh, in order that we do have coverage. Uh, and the other thing is when uh, 
power is shut off in the county. I know at my home, uh, the only access I have to emergency services is through my cell phone. <clears throat> Again, cell phone towers are, are critical for uh, even that during normal period without a, a major disaster. So, Sam, you had a follow Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just going to comment, pick up where, where uh, the chair left off. I don't see anything in here either that speaks in the, in the staff report that's, that is uh, illuminescent, glowing enough to make cause to deny the, uh, the appeal. And someone who comes from an ex-law enforcement and firefighting background, you know, California was on fire this, you know, last several years. Look at Australia today. Um, it was very important that I relied on my radio. Um, my radio is more important than the gun, actually. The radio to be able to have service capability in those emergency situations. And I actually worked during the Loma Prieta earthquake down in the, cent in the Central Coast area, and that kind of... Uh, that kind of service would be value added and would be life saving. So um, I'm just not. I, I just don't see what the uh, the the real true objections are. This is something that everyone in society likes, and many of the people that are in this room and those that have objected would be the first to call upon emergency services when they live in a very rural area that relies upon those things. So. Um, you know, I lived in an area when I lived on the Central Coast that was also rural, and, um, and the, energy, the power was out all the time. Now, I live in Roosevelt, the city of Roseville and Roseville Electric. Their power is out about less than 1% of the time. But in these county areas, as the chair said, we, you know, we rely upon those, uh, that expanded and continued uh, services that so many different agencies um, have to, have to uh, reckon with. And not providing them with the additional tools to do their jobs is an insult to their safety and your, your safety and all of our safety should we be up in that area. That concludes my comments at this time. I'll have additional comments for the uh, applicant. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Are there other comments? All right. Uh, next would be the applicant. Uh, Thank you. Presentation. Just to clarify for the record, the applicant and the appellant are the same. I'm sorry, the appellant. Thank you. Good morning, Chair. Commissioners, my name is Jared Kearse with Epic Wireless on behalf of AT&T, the applicant. Uh, we also have Andrew Lisa here, Director of AT&T New Builds for Epic Wireless, and Bryant Malesi, uh, external, external Affairs for AT&T as well. Uh, they would like to reserve time to speak in, the, in later on in the, in the hearing. Uh, we are here to, to ask kindly to support the appeal and, and reverse the uh, Denial of the project and therefore approve the use permit at 545 Miller Town Road. Um, we originally proposed a 120 foot tall monopine tower with a uh, chain link fence, standard chain link fence with vinyl slats and uh, a flat roof uh, shelter uh, with a one ton HVAC unit and a generator. Uh, we heard the public's concerns about aesthetical impacts to the area. Uh, the potential issues with the or flaws in the photo simulations that were produced. Uh, we went back to the drawing board, so to speak, and AT&T agreed to drop the top tower height down by 32 feet, equal of 88 feet, uh, 32 feet off the top. Uh, reduction of, of, of uh, coverage was, was a result, a consequence of reduction of height, but we thought it's more important to serve some uh, than, than none, in a sense. Um, in addition, we uh, would install a, a redwood fence and pitched roof shelter to uh, create a little bit more aesthetical appeal on the base station, even though it's not really visible by, by uh, dwellings. Um, we were given five alternative site analysis, uh, sites to look into, uh, provided by the public. Uh, we worked with the RF engineers with AT&T and dove into them. Uh, some of them didn't qualify because they're too close to uh, adjacent AT&T sites and would encroach on those network uh, coverages. Uh, and then, or the there's one particular site just north uh, at the fire station that uh, didn't uh, c close the coverage gap uh, along Highway 80, which is a very important gap in coverage along corridors, uh, highway corridors. So uh, none of the five are viable. We, we provided a response to the public and the zoning administrator. Um, 
and with the reasons why. Uh, we also revised the photo sims. We invited the public out to, to walk with the photographer. Uh, they flew a balloon 88 feet high in the air to mirror the, the height of the tower, give a good visual imp uh, idea of what it's truly going to look at so they don't have to trust the, uh, the, the engineer, the expert, to uh, correctly mo uh, modify and uh, develop photo sims. So uh, we invited them to uh, ask the photographer on their property and take photos from their front porch, backyard, wherever they enjoy their, their, their property. Uh, you saw one view from the backyard. That was a result of, of us allowing, uh, reaching out to the community and, and uh, being trying to be transparent with uh, the photo series. <laughs> Additionally, uh, I think two or three other shots that they invited were unfortunately only on the property line on Millertown Road and the encroachment where it, you drive into the property, not necessarily where the folks may enjoy their property, so to speak. Um, my belief, uh, educated guess, is there's trees that line Millertown Road up and down the road, um, and they would essentially block the tower from their front porch or front yard. And anyhow, um, we we do believe that the results of the photo sims uh, show uh, a great improvement from the 120 foot tower. Uh, it's visible from the street. Uh, from a backyard, from who, who knows where else, of course, but uh, we aren't blocking pristine views uh, in the area from anyone's property. They see the tip-top portion of this tower, and therefore we do believe that the conclusion is it's the least in, uh, aesthetically impactful location while, while filling the state, city infant gap in coverage. So just to give a little bit more of a summary of how we honed in on this area of Millertown and Wise Road. Uh, just about a mile and a half north, east, off of uh, Mount Vernon and Collins Drive, I think it is. There's an AT&T site, an adjacent site. Uh, and then about a mile south, a mile and a third southwest, uh, right on the Quarry property, there's another AT&T site. Our site on Millertown is essentially right in between those two sites that's filling that gap in coverage, because there is a gap on Highway 80. Our provided coverage maps show that. Uh, and the only way we could really move is northwest, in a sense, with a little caveat to that. If we move to the northeast, we're encroaching on the other tower. If we move to the southwest, we're encroaching on a tower. If we move directly south towards the freeway, we're encroaching on both. And then there's no uh, homes for the internet services that, that this tower is going to be provided. So it, it kills that deal. Uh, the northwest is an area that could have worked potentially for uh, the Connect America Fund in a sense, but then you don't cover the gap, the important gap in coverage along Highway 80 and that south portion of the coverage area that there is a gap in between, in between those two sites that I, I dis discussed. So the Millertown area is essentially the, the best location uh, to optimize coverage, fill the gap, and we did choose the least intrusive means as possible, a faux tree, a fake tree, and uh, it blends in, in my opinion, quite well. Um, so as a reminder, the purpose of this tower is twofold, to provide high-speed broadband internet wirelessly to nearby homes. We're estimating over 200 homes will be covered uh, with the service, and then provide LTE service, your typical cell phone services, talking uh, data, whatnot, um, to the area, while whether it's on the roads or, or people's homes. And that, that will stretch a mile and a half, two miles, give or take, even more sometimes. Depends on topography and other variables that are taken into consideration. Um, the bonus, as we like to say, is the first net aspect of it. Uh, the first net and Bryant Miles Millesi, <laughs> sorry, Bryant uh, Millesi will uh, go into further detail about first net. But as been ex uh, explained, it's a designated frequency for first responders during uh, emergency situations such as Paradise or Napa or what have you. Uh, it gives a dedicated circuit because cell, cell towers do become overwhelmed in those situations, and when they're overwhelmed, they don't work properly. 
So this designated uh, line will not it will prevent that from happening. Uh, so I, we heard last time, you might hear it again today, folks in the audience might say they have Verizon or they have Hughesnet or they have another means of internet or uh, LTE, cellular phone services, maybe even AT&T, I don't know. It's possible. And maybe they say it works fine, but there is a true gap in coverage. Uh, they, they, they aren't necessarily prominent in this area. They, they don't have this broadband internet services. And as county council mentioned, it's somewhat of a provision of services to AT&T if the county doesn't allow AT&T here, even though Verizon might be somewhere else or T-Mobile might be somewhere else or, or HughesNet might be there or what have you. Um, AT&T has the right for their service to be provided to, these, to the community. Uh, I have a question yes. here. Uh, so you, you talk about some of the competitors like Verizon and T-Mobile and them. Uh, is there some kind of provision that says that they could, I guess, they could lease space on this tower? Yeah. So it, it's county county code, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, they require uh, the, the towers to be co-locatable. This tower is co-locatable. Our elevations on the drawing show future carriers. That doesn't mean that carriers are currently proposed on this tower, but that's a placeholder for other carriers if they have a desire to get on the tower. And AT&T, all the carriers work mutually together because that's just the name of the business. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so to end on the note, uh, so these services are vastly utilized by the community, by people, uh, whether it's streaming uh, Netflix or, or Internet or or, uh, you know, the f fact is uh, over 90 or 80% of 911 calls are uh, used by cell phones, not landlines. And in case of emergencies, uh, it's, we find it very important. Thank you. Questions? Question for good please. Um, one of the concerns that I read in, in some of the written correspondence was basically related to the um, long-term maintenance of the the fake foliage on the pole and concerns that it would uh, that, that that there was nothing i guess provided for in writing to to assure the the neighbors in the county that 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 would be maintained properly we would be happy to add a conditions of approval if one doesn't exist already that says that if the county finds that the foliage is uh inadequate or or uh Displeasing in aesthetics that they could they could repair and often they do they they repair branches every so often um, They last quite a long time. The technology on these trees is pretty amazing Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have one more <laughs> Let me see one thing you mentioned that uh, To uh, make things look better. You're going to build a wood fence Correct and a shelter of some kind <laughs> of the, I guess a diesel engine or, uh, or something the shelter will have a pitched roof, but the shelter will have all the um, computer equipment in it, like the brains of the, okay. the communications. Uh, the the generator will have an uh, uh, enclosure on it. It's it's not like a building enclosure. It's just uh, housing that the, the motor sits in to lessen the noise uh, to the community. Okay. One of the trade-offs you think about is, you know, the chain link fence was, uh, wasn't a combustible. Correct. But the wood fence would be a combustible. Yeah. And so, you know, that's a trade-off. We, we could go back to the original proposal, but aesthetics seem to be more important to the, the community, unfortunately. But, yeah. Okay. So, at any rate, if it's combustible, you lose the tower then and lose the service. Well, uh, typically cell towers aren't the, the cause of fires. Um, oh, no. Not, I'm not saying a cause, but, but you, they're a service that's important. Yeah. And uh, uh, you'd lose a service if the tower goes out. Right. Uh, if that area is on fire, uh, heavily fire, oak trees around it, um, I don't. I don't know if the the chain link fence is going to prevent the fire from going into the the compound. So I think the point is the wood fence will burn and, and could be a problem. That's, yeah. That's and and again in paradise that's what they found. If you had a wood fence up next to a structure, that structure gone. And, if the wood uh, fence was not there, the structure survived. So, and again, we could we could be we're more than happy to go back to the previous design of the fence of being chain link, if that's the desire of you right. guys. Well, and, and the maintenance around the 
the fence too. You know, I mean, if there's tall grass around it, then you're going to have a problem. Yeah, I believe the conditions require some sort of fire buffer zone around the uh, fence line, and if if not, we could add that as well. Wayne. Ben, is it possible to quick back up kind of an area map up there? My understanding is that these cell towers work by line of sight. That's when they're most effective. They need to be tall enough because those signals are sent out. And if you happen to have something blocking between you and that tower, it's going to have an impact on your ability to access the service. That's true. To uh, it's, uh, it's more true for our broadband services. The broadband under the CAF two fund is uh, line of sight to people's homes. So the taller a tower is, the more homes it's going to reach because it does require. Basically, what's going to happen is uh, whoever signs up for the this, this, this broadband service will have a little antenna on their house, some some vantage point on the house that has a good vantage point to the tower, uh, and that's going to communicate. Similar to a direct TV dish or dish network dish, it's going to communicate to the tower. Your cell phone works a little bit differently. Your cell phone, what, when you call, uh, first of all, the antennas on the on the tower go out to the horizon, straight out, with a very small down tilt. Uh, yeah, if, if the hills there or trees are blocking, it's going to block the signal. But your cell phone also has an antenna inside of it that it's uh, it reaches the signal in the sky. So when you make a call, your cell phone shoots a signal up and captures that signal from the from the sky and, and voila you can make a call uh, anywhere in the world so um, that's kind of the difference in two of the two technologies but you are correct in the sense that hills and uh, tall trees can uh, distract the signal in, of the tower it's yeah. the original the situation how far does cell towers and I know it's different if it's a broadband situation or a cell phone but typically how far do yeah, uh, it's mainly different uh, comparing like a farmland, flatland area versus a hilly land like Posture County. Uh, so in this area, this you're side. you're looking at mile and a half to three miles, give or take. That's it. The whole cover. It, it could be more, but it it depends. It, it, though, so it doesn't. The further you are, the weaker your signal is going to be. So just because I say one and a half to three miles doesn't mean if you're four, it can't pick up the signal. It just might not be as adequate as if you're a mile away. If it's that minimal, then you are very specific as to where you have to have power. That's uh, right. Now, you said uh, you were trying to fill a gap, and you said that it, so that it wouldn't overlap other areas. Correct. So it's not a big deal if it overlaps, but the objective is to fill the gap. Uh, it is uh, to fill a gap, but it is also a big deal that we don't overlap uh, in a sense because as soon as you start encroaching on another cellular tower, uh, it quote unquote steals the services and it creates issues or errors in, this, in the network. So when you're driving or using it, you might drop calls, you might switch back and forth. It just creates all kinds of havoc in the technology, radio frequency engineer world of things. So they try to place these in a very strategic location to not... And that's the overlapping is okay, but you don't want to encroach too far into that other network because it will cause issues within the network. What was wrong with the other four sites? Uh, was it encroaching too much? Was that uh, uh, two of them encroached too much? Uh, one was on the quarry property, so that was obviously you know there's an AT and T facility already there. Uh, there's there's one uh, 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 suggested on the. PCWA training facility property of some sort. Uh, that one was, again, too close to that quarry property. Uh, then the water sewage treatment didn't really have the elevation. It was pretty close to the um, uh, quarry, quarry property as well. Uh, the Pigeony uh, powerhouse, if you will, on the bottom of Ofer, that's just in a bowl. Just just doesn't work for purposes of getting a network out. And then uh, the only one that had the chance was the Placer County uh, sh sh uh, fire station. But again, that didn't fill any gap towards the no, freeway. That's quite a ways from the side. Yeah. Well, uh, I guess what I'm thinking is across from the power house, on the other side of Over Road, is a pretty high hill. It's maybe less offensive to the community. I mean, was that even considered? Because I think it gets uh, that line of sight, it gets that tower up. But maybe that's going to encroach on other towers. 
Yeah, if it's if it's close to that uh, powerhouse. powerhouse, then it's it is too close. And it's the closer you are to the freeway, sure you cover that gap, but then you're not covering homes for the calf too, and then you're not covering a gap, a small gap to the north. Because it's not Millertown's not very far from that powerhouse. Pretty close. Right. Uh, we're, but we got to remember the south, the site to the southwest is one and a third mile away, and the one to the northeast is a mile and a half away. So even a quarter of a mile can make a big difference. Pretty close. Yeah. Your your Sure. I have a couple of questions. If you'll be so kind as to indulge uh, <coughs> me and the other uh, commissioners and those present. First, could you tell me about that 190 gallon tank? I just have a question on that. An, an, in an exigent, you know, circumstance, emergency circumstance like that Loma Prieta earthquake I brought up uh, before, uh, where power was out, by the way, for a week. In, uh -huh. um, in, in, at the minimum in many areas, and, and it's at my house at that time, and I had no generator, so it was out for an extended period of time. Uh, what I, my question is is, is uh, a week? How long would that last in that in that uh, kind of a circumstance? Yeah, they they estimate between five and eight days. Uh, but AT and T has what they call Tiger teams. They they go out and they're ded dedicated to filling up diesel generator tanks, especially during outages. Uh, to ensure that they don't go off, go off air. There's also a battery backup that will help help the, the longevity of the outage as well. Right. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Second, we're talking about a diesel generator here, not a gasoline one. So maybe Correct. some some people are confusing the two. Gasoline, highly flammable. Decent, diesel, flammable only under combustible situations, under pressure. Right. Um, the, the third thing I'd like to raise is on the uh, the materials used in defense. So there was an objection to using chain link fence. Was it ever discussed or considered that the fencing might be, you know, painted a, a dark color to blend in, brown, if it was chain link? Uh, we, we, we proposed vinyl slats that would be essentially tan or green or whatnot. So, yeah, that's doable. Uh, and and I, I'm just befuddled as to how the residents don't see the... Uh, the importance to, of, of something like this for those exigent emergency situations. You know, I'm a property owner up in Tahoe, too, and I drive that thoroughfare uh, quite often. Highway 80 is a transcontinental interstate, very heavy traffic, and uh, you lose phone calls when you drive through that little strip. Um, can you demonstrate, or do you have any material that I, do, if I missed it in there, my apologies, about the, the rate of the phone calls that get dropped when people are on cell phones driving along that way? Not the residents at this time. They already know all about the lack of service there. Yeah. I don't have hard uh, data, per se, of how many calls get dropped in, in the 80 area. But uh, the coverage map, I don't know if it's in this. If you have access to it, uh, Bennett, the coverage map shows a, a somewhat of a dead zone on Highway 80 uh, for about a half mile or so, which might sound small, but it's not. Right. Okay. Well, thank you for your... Uh for your clarifications on that. You know, just in, in closing, nobody wants a cell phone tower in his or her backyard. I, I think that, um, but yet everyone wants the benefits of that service. So they want it in somebody else's backyard. Um, this day and age, I, I think that the, the, the uh, benefits uh, hugely outweigh the risks or the uh, objections in this case. And for all of the purposes, uh, for all of the different needs down the line, no pun intended, uh, and all the emergency services and everyone else, that's police, fire, you know, you, uh, forestry department, uh, BLM, uh, the federal folks that are up in that area, they're all going to be able to take advantage of that cell site's use should there be one of those emergency situations like that Loma Prieta earthquake where all of us, law enforcement and firefighters, were operating on one station um, to communicate together all across that, the entire county where, where that was. So, right. so thank you for your um, for your clarification. You're welcome, uh, Wayne. You had a question. I, I want to kind of follow on something that was said earlier about the combustibility of a wooden fence. Uh, was there any consideration of doing a block fence? I know it's more expensive, but it's not combustible. Uh, no, and and AT&T would be open to that. I think yeah. that would be a, if as much 
non-combustible material that you can use around these sites will ensure that their ability to stay up even if a catastrophic fire moves through that area. Okay. Any other questions? Of you? Yes. Uh, just, uh, I thank you. I have a few questions. I know that some of these might be um, might be dealt with in an environmental report, but we've approved uh, a cell phone tower before, and some of the things that that people brought up were access. Is there direct access right off the road to this facility? Yes. And and then these are pretty quick. Um, how often would someone be at this site? Uh, on average, one time a month or one time a quarter. And then what would the noise level be it, as best as you can determine now? Would we meet the expectations with noise level? With yeah, the, the main noise would come from the generator. Uh, I believe it's right around 67 decibels at 23 feet, 7 meters. Um, so as you move further away, your, your sound's going to dissipate, of, of course, and that's only for emergency reasons. Um, and then you got a one one ton HVAC that's attached to the shelter. Uh, we most likely all have three five-ton units on our houses. This is a one-ton unit, so it's very small, and it's it's uh, intrinsically uh, satisfactory to the noise ordinance. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other? All right. So thank you, uh, and we may call you back later. But at thank this you. point in time, then. Uh... And I'd I'd also remind that I would like to reserve time for my counterparts as well later. Say that again. I'd like to reserve time afterwards for from for, for my counterparts. Thank you. So at this time, uh, it's time for uh, public comment and. I guess you'll be reading the list. Okay, so I'll say the first three names. Apologies if I pronounce anyone's name wrong. Kelly Warman, Mark Rideout, Sierra George. Just as a point of clarification, Council, oh. you said earlier that from the environmental standpoint, we're not the under the federal law, we can't respond to the issue of the um, this uh, issue of uh, the radiation that comes off of it, right? Yeah. Yes, that's accurate. As long as uh, the facility is in compliance with the applicable FCC and exposure saying, limits, and they're saying it is, and they're so, saying it is, so then you can't consider that your decision, that. right? Okay. Thank you. Welcome. And Hi. you have three minutes, and the. There'll be a uh, green light and then a yellow light with one minute to go and then red light when it's done. Okay, so first of all, um, I am objecting based on visual. Uh, I live directly across the street from the tower. <clears throat> and in oh, fact, my- We need your name. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Kelly Warman. Um, I live at 600 Millertown Road, to directly across the street. And our house is gonna be as close to this tower as the house <laughs> on the property. Um, we're that close to it. The, the tower can go, uh, even though the, the, it's going to be a visual blight, it's going to be at least 40 feet above the existing trees, and they can add 20 more feet without coming back and getting your approval. Um, if AT&T hasn't shared, they claim that they have this coverage gap, but all of us get good cell service. You can't find online that they have any coverage gap. You can't see where their towers are. Um, if there's a big coverage gap, they haven't shared it with us, and where are these 200 homes? Because I think we're not going to even be able to get service from this gap. But basically, it's going to be a blight because of the visual impact, the sound, and, um, um, I, you know, the gentleman mentioned that, no, you know, he thinks that it's not going to be a, a blight. But when you look from our front door, from any of our property, that we enjoy all three and a half acres, not just the, the part that's, um, you know, on the back side that he think, thinks will be shielded. So I think that, that um, they haven't shared that. They haven't been forthright on where their gaps are. It's going to be this huge thing. Yes, uh, we know that fire, first responders need cell service. They get it from Verizon, and it works very well. And I don't think that we should have to live with this visual blight in our neighborhood so that AT&T can, can compete with Verizon. I think that they haven't shared enough of other sites that they've considered and that the fact that, that they don't have good coverage because you, you can't find that documented anywhere with anything that they've, they've put in their proposal or online. So um, I, I think there are other sites that could, 
could be there. The vinyl fence that they proposed originally, vinyl is flammable also. It melts, it burns, and so uh, just going back to a chain link fence with vinyl in it is not going to solve any flammability problems. Um, and it, you know, and I think that this noise disturbance, uh, well, well, an air conditioner running constantly will uh, maybe be within the noise disturbance. But if you go up to um, the the cell tower that's up at at on off of Forest Hill Road next to PCWA, and you stand next to that and you listen to it, and that's going to be 24 hours a day. That you know, you it's it's really loud, and and that's what we're going to have to live with. And I just don't think it's right. Um, that AT&T should 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 do this um, when they're not. Uh, it's not needed. It's not needed in our area. So I, I'll give my last six seconds. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. I'm Mark Rideout, and I'm here today as a private citizen and property owner at 10465 Dutchman's Mine Road, just a bit north of this site, off of Millertown. I'd like to follow up to my three letters on this uh, uh, project, um, which weren't included in the record originally, including the one to your commission uh, dated on the 7th. Um, I want to urge you to uphold the denial of this project. Um, my family's owned the property since 1924, and I've lived there since 2001. Uh, it's the wrong place for the tower. Um, I recognize the con connectivity requirements for emergency services. But I wish our telecom group at the county could speak about the interoperability network that they've been working with CAL FIRE and public service. I don't know that we need cell service to augment what the county already has in place. They've spent a lot of money on this plan. Um, Verizon tried to put a tower at Wise and Bald Hill. Um, that didn't make it this far in the process. I'm personally willing to participate in community forums to talk with the community and the different providers, where is the place that makes sense in the OFER community? They continue to look for different locations. Um, we could have the OFER Area Property Owners Association involved and other folks that want to come and talk about this to look for a commercial or industrial style site that's more appropriate for this use. Um, AT&T responded to uh, alternatives that the neighbors provided where we really think it's their own uh, responsibility to provide proposals, the idea of something south of Ofer Road could be appropriate. The aesthetics weren't really mentioned. The tower simulations didn't show when you're standing on Millertown Road and you're looking under the canopy that's been trimmed up for fuels work, you'd be staring directly at the bunker and the fenced yard. Um, so that's what the lady was speaking about previously. Um, so because of aesthetics that I just mentioned, uh, it's absolutely visible, the noise from the generator running during power safety shutoffs, which we had 60 hours uh, this last fall, property values, water quality, air quality from the diesel generator running, cultural resources. It's really the wrong place, and I understand, I've heard peripherally that Nevada County doesn't allow this use in their residentially zoned districts, something else to talk about another time. It's not consistent with the rural character. It's contrary to the orderly development of the neighborhood. For these and other points in my prior correspondence, I urge you to deny approval and direct them to engage in a dialogue with the community that can solve this question once for all about providing service in our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, my name is Sierra George, and I live at 677 Millertown Road, and our property is directly adjacent to the tower site. In fact, one of the pictures was from our backyard. So I'm here today to ask that you deny the appeal for the permit. AT&T states this tower is for increased cell phone coverage. Living next door, we use AT&T for our phone and internet and have no problems in that area. We have full coverage. And according to their website, they also show full coverage for all of Ofer area. But first, this 88-foot cell tower will have the possibility of going up an additional 20 feet, as was just mentioned, without community consent. And this is due to Section 6409A of the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act of 2012. So now we have a possible 108-foot tower that will not blend in with the existing trees as it's much taller. And as the owners have cleared the land, it is not tucked back in a grove of trees concealed as the appeal states. And no matter how they make it, it is still a fake tree that everyone will see as they drive down the road and enter the rural neighborhood of Millertown and Ofer areas. <clears throat> so with the possibility of a 108-foot tower, which becomes more detrimental to our health, 
safety, peace, comfort, and general welfare, which in Section 1758-140 of the Zoning Code, Section 3, states that for approval, a building's project facility must not be detrimental to the health, safety, peace, and comfort, and general welfare of the people residing or working in the neighborhood. And we've talked about a little bit about the fire risks and those kinds of things. But along with the fire risk, the big concern is the property value decrease of the community homes. You now have to disclose that you are near a cell tower to real estate agents and must note neighborhood noise, nuisance, and other problems, according to the California Association of Realtors. The only reason to require disclosure is because it is clear this information makes a difference to a buyer. So many studies nationwide cite that the public perception to potential health and safety risks have resulted in decreased house prices as much as up to 20%. So people don't want to live next to a cell tower, not just because of the health concerns, but also due to the aesthetics and public safety reasons. This tower will be seen from all over our rural community. It's not why we moved to the country. And these points all go back to the reasons the cell tower was denied, denied excuse me, by the zoning administrator in the first place. It's inconsistent with the character of the neighborhood and has adverse effects on the adjacent neighbors, as well as the health, safety, peace, comfort, and general welfare of why cell towers should not belong in rural residential areas. So in closing, I ask that the denial of the appeal be upholded. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have Ann Olson, Laurel Brzez, and Maria Baranowski. Good morning. I came with visual aids. All right. Is there any possible way, since I'm presenting technical information, I could have a few more than three minutes? I, I say please. I, I, I think keep it to three minutes, and then if there is information that we. Well, then like, I'm going to go really quick. Then. Please do. Uh, good, morning. good morning. Good morning. Commissioners, how are you? My name is Ann Olson. I live at 693 Millertown Road. We also own a home right next door at 705 Millertown Road. Um, I am a, both a registered civil engineer and a registered traffic engineer in the state of California. I'm also a national certified professional traffic operations engineer. So briefly, let me just tell you what I did. I did a stopping site distance analysis of the potential driveway location uh, relative to Placer County standards, state standards, and federal standards. And let me show you the results of that study. What stopping site distance is, it is the distance that it takes a vehicle to stop from the time a driver sees something sitting out in the roadway. So that's critical as it relates to vehicles moving in and outside of, uh, of a particular driveway. What you see in the visual here in red is the location of the proposed driveway. It sits inside a tight horizontal curve with an embankment that includes both trees and rock outcroppings to the north, right here. As a result, that limits site distance to 85 feet. Federal and state standards call for about 250 feet. You see that in the pink line here. And county standards Plate 116, as specified by the Department of Public Works, calls for 385 feet of site distance, as you, as you see here in the green line. So whether you look at state, federal, or local standards, not only are we deficient, we're highly deficient. The applicant stood up here and said we're only going to have a vehicle or two per month. But roadway design standards are not set as a function of trip generation. They are set basically for safe traffic operations, no matter the number of vehicles. And Department of Public Works specified Plate 116. To do Plate 116, you'd have to basically come back and level this whole area here. This is much higher than Millertown Road. You would lose over a dozen trees. You would remove historic rock outcropping. So there's virtually no way to put this driveway in and be consistent with county standards as you have to be to legally approve this. I want to also add, um, as one of my previous speakers said, that 
My husband and I have at and cell phone service. We have at and Internet. There is no significant gap out there. We understand emergency services. How they had their first net through Verizon. So we really see no gap that needs to be closed. And I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. And you did that fast. Thank you very much. Do you want me to leave this here or take it? I'll take that. Hi. Hi. Um, <clears throat> my name is Laurel Braziz, and I'm an OFA resident living at 1320 Desmond Lane. Um, I have brought the coverage map, if you'd like to take a look at it. I can state from where we live, we do not have adequate broadband or cell coverage. Uh, we are AT&T customers. However, well, and that is our only option. Uh, we cannot connect to Verizon uh, with an adequate coverage. The cell um, calls get dropped all the time. And our internet connection, the data connection through uh, other services is just too minimal. And right now, what we're receiving through AT&T uh, data connection is still only uh, 6 megabits per second download speed, which is not considered broadband by any means. Uh, we're excited about the prospect of this tower coming into our community because as this map demonstrates there are significant coverage gaps in our area um, we would love the opportunity to be able to hotspot our home um, we have currently AT&T DSL for our home internet usage which is our only choice I can say that we've tried other um, carrier options, such as uh, CalNet, for example. Their solution to us was we could possibly run a cable to the top of the tallest tree on our property, and maybe we could pick up a signal. Otherwise, they can't. due to our topography, the beautiful topography in Ofer, which can cause these sorts of issues, um, we can't connect to the tower. Um, I, I hear a lot of, um, okay, so I'm just going to say this portion. I sympathize. Where we live, where our, J, our property is adjacent to property that's owned by Ofer Elementary School. And it was open land about, uh, well, a few years ago, they developed that property without notifying us at all with a huge 50,000 kilowatt solar array. And that's what we look at now from all of our back windows, our backyard, our pasture. We weren't happy about it, but we got used to it. And that is a community service. It, it benefits the community and the savings that the school uh, enjoys by not paying for those additional energy costs, which also benefits the students. Um, Ultimately, I think property rights are as important as other rights. Rights to assembly, religion, um, freedom of speech. I do want to also say one thing. My husband is a law enforcement officer, and we verified through AT&T that he can get a chip in his work phone so that he can be identified as a law enforcement officer um, who could use the first net services that are available. Thank you, Thank you very much. Before you go, if any of those documents, if you're interested in having those be part of the record, you'll need to leave them with the clerk. And that would also go for Ms. Olson, too, if she's okay. still in here. And this was taken from October's hearing. So this was available at October's hearing. Um, where should I leave it? Oh, Sue is the clerk. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good, morning, good morning, afternoon. Um, I'm Maria Biernowski. I own a couple of properties on Millertown, directly across from the proposed project. And before I forget, I just wanted to note the cell tower that Mr. Nader asked about, co-location of um, different companies on that tower, is addressed in the drawings. However, the analysis 
for the RFs was done only for the AT&T portion and not for any future um, connectivity. So the information is there, but not all there like the rest of this project. Um, we live in a community that is noted for its um, rural beauty. We've got scrub oaks, rock outcroppings, the Ofer area from Millertown and Wise up to Bonnie Lane historically has 11 um, mines from the 1850s that are historic. My property is historic. The property that they're trying to put the cell tower on is historic. No uh, um, analysis at all has been done um, to determine um, significance of any of these properties and the effect of the cell tower on the properties. This is a federal undertaking. It's not just a local project. By virtue of this being licensed by the FCC, it's subject to 106 review, which is the National Historic Preservation Act. That hasn't been done. And normally what these guys do is they get it approved by the locals first, then they go back to the SHPO and say the locals approved it, so just please approve this. That's not right. Um, the project itself, I'm an architect. I've built projects up and down the state, so I kind of get construction, and I understand what um, building does to an environment. And... Um, if you look at, and I don't know if you got a copy of my various letters that I sent to you, but in order to build a foundation for a mono tower, just the mono tower itself, not including all the rest of the stuff that is included with the rest of this, this is what it looks like. This is about 36 cubic yards of concrete built into a bucolic setting where there's historic farmhouses and rock outcroppings and, and all the rest of it. Um, there's a road that's defined in the application as a partially paved road. It's not a partially paved road. There's a farm gate to the lower 40 that goes back into the rest of the property. In order to get the approval, the county has mandated that the developer um, develop the road to fire truck standards, which means a 70, I think it's a $75,000 uh, 75000 pound fire truck um, to get it up there, which means A, B, grading, all the rest of it. So you got, <laughs> you got a lot of removed stuff on that site that we're all going to be front and center staring at. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next is Bryant Malesi and Sabina. I'm sorry. I'm going to mispronounce this. Pellison. Pellison. Hello, board. Um, I'm Brian Malacy. I'm uh, with at and I'm their external affairs manager in the Sacramento region. Um, I first want to let you know that I've been talking with the county's IT department, and we've been letting them know that there are certain areas that we do want to provide coverage, and this is one of those areas that we've been in discussions to let them know that this is an area that is in need of coverage. Um, there's, so there's two parts of this tower that um, are essential. It's the Connect America Fund and the FirstNet services, and I wanted to just give you a little bit more background on those two issues. Uh, the Connect America Fund, it's the FCC's program to expand access to voice and broadband services for un underserved areas. Through Connect America, the FCC provides funding to telephone companies like AT&T to help with the cost of building new network infrastructure or performing network upgrades to provide voice and broadband services in areas where it is lacking. Connect America is a multi-year program comparable comparable to extending electricity and phone service to rural America early in the 20th century and building the interstate highway system in the 1950s and 1960s. To ensure Connect America support is used efficiently, the FCC has identified census blocks uh, where there is lack of service, um, and this area is considered a census block where there has been uh, lack of service. Um, AT&T in California is using this partnership uh, with Connect America Fund to provide internet access to more than 141,000 homes and small businesses uh, in the state. Um, and regarding FirstNet, uh, the purpose of FirstNet is to establish, operate, and maintain a high-speed public safety broadband wireless network 
throughout the country, and AT&T is initiating that deployment to, to help first responders during natural disasters or catastrophic wildfires in this region, just like this past summer. The federal government has been working towards the first net system ever since the September 11th attacks, uh, highlighted the inability at the time for deployed public safety networks to handle a true crisis situation. FirstNet has currently been used uh, by first responders during this active wildfire season uh, th throughout Northern California. Uh, so to reemphasize the constituents, the community will benefit from the site through high-speed broadband internet, better cellular mobility, and first responder public safety capabilities through FirstNet. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Sabina Pellicer. I live on uh, off of Millertown Road. We're in uh, at the top of Star Thistle, which is we would sort of look toward the tower coming back the other way. Um, pretty much, we uh, as a community have come together over this issue from the very beginning, and we um, have spent a lot of time with our various uh, computers and um, going to the county and looking up all sorts of data and information, and so. Um, I'm really proud of us as a community. This whole issue has brought us together. Um, so there were only two things that I wanted to add to this discussion today, and one of the things that concerns me um, is this um, uh, the focus on the first net service. AT&T's first net service um, is mirrored by an identical service for other carriers, Verizon specifically. And when this was first proposed at the first hearing on this tower, um, I went back uh, and spoke with, contacted um, the sheriff's department in Placer County. I contacted Cal Fire and I contacted the uh, fire chief, Placer County Fire. I was told by all three that they love the service, they get funding from the state to pay for that service, but their contract for Placer County is with Verizon, so they already have the service, which was sort of left out of the original first net discussion in the first hearing that we had on this issue. So, yes, we as residents, we first and foremost don't want to have Paradise be our future. I also responded to Paradise for animal search and rescue afterwards, and it was a horror, as Mr. Cannon uh, discussed. So the last thing we would ever do is oppose this if we thought for one second that it was going to move us closer to being safer in that kind of a situation or, or any other natural disaster. We're not, we're not crazy. We, we know what we're talking about. So we already have that service. It's, it's a different name. They don't call it FirstNet because it's Verizon's version of it. But the county already has that contract for our area, for all of Placer County, with a different carrier. So it's at this point, you know, that service exists. So I don't want to see this become an issue based on misinformation because the county is already contract with Verizon for the same service. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was it. All right. Have you have you spoken? No. Okay. Come on up. I just want to make a couple comments based on your name. My name is David Warman. I live at 600 Miller Town Road. I just wanted to make a couple comments because we listen to AT and T like they're factual, like they're presenting facts, and they said that you drive down I-80 and you lose cell phone calls. That's a myth. I drive that all the time. I go from Sacramento to Reno, Verizon. You don't drop one call. There's no gap there. It's been mentioned there's no gap on their map. That's what their marketing people say. So I think what the other thing that's not been addressed is, there. you know, this is an industrial project in a residential area. Make no mistake about it. 300 yards away, there's industrial property where you can put this. They say this is the only place. Well, I don't believe them because they didn't tell us the truth about these gaps on the highway. That's a myth. And the other thing is, why don't they address the need by taking their existing towers and making them taller? They got to they got to have a, a cell tower at the quarry, make it taller. Because that's not affecting homes and people that live by it. So, those are my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments from the uh, public? If not, uh, we'll close the public uh, comment period and bring it back to the commission. Uh, any questions that the commission would like answered? Mind if, uh, oh. yeah. 
actually, it probably would be good for the applicant to come back and um, answer questions that you can. I'm sorry, the appellant. The appellant and applicant are the same. Tone. Yes, I'm forward. <laughs> you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Andrew Lisa. I'm with Epic Wireless, representing AT and T. I appreciate the comments that were said today. I think um, any time that we're developing an area such as this, there's always a lot of um, public interest, and I think it's important. I think it shows um, the level of interest in the community, and it shows um, the desire for um, improvements to be made and for um, certain aspects of a community to be retained. And, and I think that I don't want that to uh, be lost on the planning commissioners uh, this afternoon. I want to just uh, simply reiterate a few of the points that we made earlier and, and maybe address some of the concerns as well. But um, we heard some of those concerns loud and clear. We dropped the facility height. Um, so we had you know, a, a resident just speaking about increasing the height of other facilities um, to try to enhance coverage. We've actually done the opposite in this case, where we're, we're dropping the height of the tower to try to make it more aesthetically appealing, to try to better blend with the surrounding environment. Um, the design of it being a monopine or a faux tree pole is something that helps to, to reduce the visual impact to the community. It's, it's something we've used in many other rural residential communities, many other communities similar to this within Placer County. We've utilized this design and placement method, and we found lots of success to increase services to the community. Um, unfortunately, as technology advances and as we change the use of our cell phones and we change from merely making phone calls to using data to streaming with relatives to running businesses through your cell phone whether it's a point of sale or using internet services from working from home uh, the technology requires facilities to be closer to the user and so there was some early discussion about how far can this service actually emit from facilities and, and what type of coverage are we looking at? And, and you heard from, from Jared with our office that it's actually a smaller footprint than what we've seen in the past. So we are beyond the days of hiding facilities on mountaintops and getting the same level of service as we've come accustomed to. Um, because of that, we find the need for facilities closer to residential units. But with that, we find facilities specifically designed to serve residential units, which is what we're proposing today. Uh, that's the internet uh, providing that you're, that you're going to get out of a facility like this. So I think with, um, with the efforts that were made to address the aesthetic concerns of the community, in addition with some of um, the discussion from county council with regards to the Telecommunications Act of 1996 and some of the limitations that that act puts on local uh, government agencies, uh, specifically how it speaks to when a significant gap in service or coverage is identified, which I believe has been demonstrated with the coverage maps presented to you and to staff throughout the application process. Um, wireless carriers are allowed to provide and enhance their services when doing so in the least intrusive means. And this facility with the reduction in height, with the redesign, uh, to a, a faux tree to blend in with the, with the surrounding environment, with the alternative analysis review of other proposed facility locations by the community, I think we have demonstrated that sufficiently that this is the least intrusive means to fill that significant gap in coverage, and thereby a denial of this proposal and a denial of placing this enhanced service to the community would effectively be a prohibition of service under the Telecommunications Act of 1996. And um, that, uh, that is the position of AT&T that, that it was uh, demonstrated in the letter from AT&T's counsel. And so I just want to make sure that that is being considered as well when uh, you move today to make a decision. I, I, have, I have a question for you. Yes, sir. And that when I'm hearing, if we uh, support the appeal, and not the denial that the uh, zoning administrator. Are you prepared to do uh, a CEQ document? Because I, I understand that's what would be required, or at least what I was hearing. Well, and, I would. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. 
at any rate, I guess to me it <coughs> seems like uh, a lot of the issues we're talking about really are kind of floating around. You know, where uh, a CQ document uh, would put it all on paper and at least give everybody a chance to uh, see what the analysis provides. So I guess the question is, are you prepared to, uh, if we were to support the appeal, to uh, do a CEQ document? I, I might be able to provide some insight on that. If uh, the commission ultimately uh, elects to support the appeal, the proper way probably would be to make a um, tentative decision and then continue the matter back so that staff could provide findings and also do the environmental review um, supportive of that. And that environmental review may be an exemption. It may be a negative declaration. It may be an EIR. I don't know if that has been fully decided by staff yet. But um, that at, at that point, I guess the environmental review decision would be undertaken, and then uh, staff would come back with that environmental finding and, and ask for a decision by the commission with respect to that. So I guess that was talking. That's what I was talking about. Sam is next. And commissioner, if I may, just add to uh, county council's point there. I do want to point out that the staff report that was presented to the zoning administrator, which was a result of staff's time and effort in re reviewing this proposal, came to a conclusion that the CEQA, the project is cat, which is what you're speaking of, California Environmental Quality Act. The project is categorically exempt from environmental review pursuant to the provisions of Section 15303 of the California Environmental Quality Act and Section 18.36.050 of the Placer County Environmental Review Ordinance. That was the finding of staff of, as it relates to CEQA review for the proposal. That was what was presented to the zoning administrator. So whether or not it would need to go forth through a, a subsequent sequel review, um, I, I'm not sure. I mean, we're more than happy yeah. to allow a sequel review to take place. However, it was staff's understanding that we were exempt under their initial review. Well, it would be consistent with what our, our, our uh, council has just said. Now, if I use the wrong word, you know, maybe I shouldn't have used the word sequel, but uh, oh, I did hear uh, some additional analysis that you know, the public comment uh, is dealing with a lot of environmental factors that really the public doesn't feel have been addressed. And so I guess I'm feeling like, you know, maybe we need to somehow get get these answers out there in paper somewhere, you know. But I think that's what you're talking yeah, about. And um, just to be clear, the staff report that was provided to the zoning administrator, the zoning administrator ultimately uh, denied this. So that st was staff's recommendation. There was never a finding of exemption under CEQA at the zoning administrator level. Uh, when staff goes back and reviews it, if, if the commission ultimately asks staff to do so, they may come up with that same CEQA determination, or it may be a different one, but they are not bound to that initial recommendation. Okay. And just to be clear, at t is supportive to go through a formal CEQA review process to make whatever finding is necessary, whether that be uh, mitigated neck deck or neck deck or... Whatever so, be the case. So at any rate, I guess from a layman's standpoint, it seems like we need to somehow clear up, uh, you know, the issues that we're hearing from the public here. And if we can do that, that would be a very desirable thing. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If you will uh, please um, respectfully indulge me with some of these questions and comments, I would appreciate it. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say for the record that I have all due respect for the mountain folks that have taken the time to come down here today or from wherever they came to come on this issue. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I was considered one of, or I am considered one of those mountain folks from that Santa Cruz rural house that I have, and I also that rural um, uh, lake, outside of Lake, uh, lake Tahoe City um, residence that I have. So I have gr a great deal of empathy for anyone wanting a, um, a being opposed to something that's aesthetically unpleasing, but I want to I want to uh, digress into the fact that um, while I was on the Roseville Planning Commission for eight years, there, there was arguably not one single cell phone tower addition that didn't meet with a huge uh, amount of uh, of, of uh, opposition, 
And when it came down to it, really what that was about is if you ask the question, do you want a cell phone or do you, or do you want a cell tower? Excuse me if I misspoke. Or do you not want a cell tower? And once we got down and, and uh, got down to the, to, the, to, you know, to the core, they didn't want the cell, they didn't want the tower at all. So then I asked, well, how many residents would really want um, adequate cell service if they only had to rely upon their cell phone to make an emergency 911 call? Then the answer changes. AT&T has gone out of its way um, to work amicably with the community and to basically reduce the, the height of that tower almost in half. That's 32 feet, if I'm, if I'm correct. And these towers that have the, uh, the disguising components on them are also more expensive, significantly more expensive than the regular towers. <clears throat> it, it is, as for the gentleman who was speaking earlier about the, the myth of gaps in cell service along the area, correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah, you wouldn't have gaps necessarily if you're a Verizon customer, but we're talking about the AT&T customers. So they're treated uh, disparately. And arguably, I could make the case that one company is being treated preferentially over another versus AT&T versus Verizon. I don't think that's particularly fair. Um, ultimately, it comes down to the risk-benefits analysis. And I, I just think in, in a case like this, you know, for the, how many of you know today, that today is National Law Enforcement Day? It is. And from someone who comes from that, profession, uh, that profession in an earlier career, I have all due respect for, for that uh, today's day because those are the folks that put their lives on the line every day. And in an exigent emergency situation that could occur in that area, we may need to have that cell service. And the, many of the people that are in opposition now would be the first ones clamoring for additional cell service for those, under those emergency circumstances. <clears throat> and, and if one comment, commenter said, well, we don't want these in rural areas. OK, well, let's look at, let's look at the desert areas of California the Mojave Desert. Maybe we don't want any cell phones, any cell towers on Highway or Interstate um, 15 or out on Highway 58 going from Bakersfield out to Barstow. But the public request for those, uh, the clients of both AT&T and Verizon and others, is, is so much dramatically in favor of those, cell, of those cell towers because of the capability, the expanded capability. I spoke earlier about all of the agencies being able to cooperate in that Loma Prieta earthquake on one radio channel. And this is something that has a direct correlation to this. So therefore, uh, I, would, uh, I would urge uh, support for the, for the installation of the tower. Thank you, Mr. Could Chair. I have one clarification from AT&T? Just uh, something that came up was the first net service. Um, and it was stated that uh, Verizon provides that service. One of the things that I heard in Paradise is what you're doing is bringing people from all over the United States in, uh, first responders, that may not have Verizon. They may have AT&T. They may have T-Mobile. So what is the interconnectability on the um, first net service between all those providers in order you know, to, to serve the first responders? Yeah. Uh, Jared Kearsley with Epic Wireless on behalf of AT&T. Uh, so I think there's a disconnect or misunderstanding uh, uh, comparing, saying that uh, Posture County has Verizon, so they already have FirstNet. FirstNet's completely different. It's it's not about the chip that's in the phone or the computers and, and the cars. It's it's a it's a service that's going to be provided only by AT and T, who teamed up with FirstNet nationwide, uh, and that is going to pro provide a designated circuit for first responders. Now. What she's alluding to is the fact that Placer County, Sheriff, or Fire, what have you, has Verizon chips countywide in their phones or computers, so they don't care about AT&T, they don't need it. Well, that's, that's a separate deal. They, they might have a countywide uh, uh, contract with Verizon, perhaps maybe AT&T too, I don't know, but bottom line is, First net is completely different than having a chip in the car, in the in the computer or the phone. So of Verizon. The, so the Placer County first responders would have access to FirstNet then. 
You're correct. In addition, in addition to yeah, the Verizon, because what happens? Sure, they have Verizon chips in their phones and computers. Well, what happens when the uh, fire happens and everyone tries to use a network? It gets saturated, over overdone. Now, uh, first responders can't use, or anyone for that matter, residents can't use AT and T cell tower. But now, first responders will be able to sign up for FirstNet and therefore have a designated circuit in addition to their chips in the phone. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? I've got a question for you. Uh, it was brought up by a few of the people from the public that uh, there could be a little bait and switch on the height of this tower and that you could bump it by 20 <coughs> feet without anybody knowing about it. Uh, so would you respond to that? Yeah, what they're alluding to is, is, uh, is what what we have, uh, call 6409. It's it's a it's a code in, in the act that says if a uh, if so, if another carrier wants to co-locate on on a tower, but that tower isn't sufficient in height, then instead of proposing a new tower somewhere else in the vicinity, they are allowed to increase the height by either 10 percent or 20 feet, whichever's uh, taller, uh, to prevent other towers from going in. It, it's not intended or not used for carriers to just increase the height because they want to or they feel the need to. Uh, it's there for co-locators when they can't co-locate as is. So right now you see other carrier future locations uh, below the top level. Those are all suitable locations for this tower. So essentially you would need three, three, two or three more other carriers before that tower is overloaded and then they need to extend it up. That's what... The purpose of that is so what's the odds of that one i don't know it's small it's small yeah, yeah. Right. It, 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 in my line of work i don't see it happening you don't see it happening. No, only one co-locating jeff you have a question um I've, I've dealt with cell towers considerably as a, a on the landlord side of the equation um and i have i've kind of seen them come and go as technology changes as it's Phones get more advanced than the need for some. Do you have a a lifespan assigned to this tower? Uh, the contract is twenty five years. Okay, okay, and and at some point, probably within that time, technology is going to change and 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 quite possibly make this and others in the area not necessary. It's it's possible, but yeah, who knows where technology goes? Uh, it's been changing dramatically for the last you know three decades, so. Okay. Where it could go in the next 25 years, who knows? Um, but yeah, usually what happens is technology uh, decreases in size, uh, smaller antennas, more technology in the antenna. So you, you might have nine or 12 antennas, um, but they're serving multiple different types of technologies uh, that to our naked eye on the ground, we don't, we don't see. We always see as a panel antenna, that's it. But it's broadband, it's cellular, it's data, it's LT, it's all different frequencies in one antenna. Are there other questions? All right. If not, let's bring it back to the commission and discussion. Discussion points here for me, I guess, if I could. Yes. Um, uh, I, there's one of these very close to my home um, in Granite Bay. Um, it's sitting up on top of a hilltop and that I live below. Um, I have to tell you that when I went looking for it, it's quite visible when you quit looking for it. It blends nicely. Um, I just don't see it anymore. And, and, and I would, would think the, the potential for, for many of you that that would exist also. Um, if, as a commission, we were to, to look at uh, supporting the tower going in, my, my concerns would be things like the, the maintenance of, of the, the faux foliage and keeping that in, in good condition. Um, I think the value of a, a block wall around the enclosure versus a wood structure would be beneficial both to AT&T and to the neighborhood. Um, and I think if there doesn't exist, there would need to be some conditions added relating to um, the decommissioning of the structure and the facility when it is no longer in use to make sure that there's provisions in there for it, it to come down and be removed at least to some extent. Um, versus just the antennas peeled off and the pole left sitting there. And, uh, and I have seen, seen both occur as I've seen cell sites come and go. 
Um, I agree with our chairman that when you have major incidences, you have agencies coming from, from all over the state and sometimes even out of the state. And they're not all going to be Verizon customers. They're not all going to have the same service. Being able to keep those people in the communication gap during a major incident is crucial. Um, radio traffic gets overwhelmed really quick. You can only listen to so many channels. You can only monitor so much conversation while you're trying to safely operate your fire apparatus and, and keep track of where you're at. Um, telephones become much more useful than a radio. And I think it's critical that that service, especially out in the, the, the more rural areas where incidences that we're discussing are, are more likely to happen, um, that that communication is, is premium if it's available. And that's my two cents. All right. right. Wayne? Um, and I just want to piggyback on Jeff's comments. And Jeff has a fire background, so he certainly appreciates, the, like Sam, the ability to have access uh, during an emergency type of uh, communication. Um, I think if we do go ahead and support this project, I agree with Jeff that if it should be a block wall. One of the benefits is not just because of its um, certainly not combustible, is that uh, it could also help buffer some of the sound coming off of the air conditioning unit, uh, because it, uh, from the pictures we're looking at, it looks like the wall would be high enough uh, that the unit would be down below that. So again, it may capture a lot of that sound. So that would be important that goes forward. Mike. Yeah, one of the things, that's, there's other the block wall, there's also other solid surface walls that uh, can be used, I would say, if we're going to say anything. It's non-combustible. Non-combustible. Non-combustible, yeah. okay. You have any comments? Uh, no, I think I've made it. You know, I, I'm inclined to uh, support the appeal. Okay. Given the fact, given the fact that, given the fact that we're going to see the analysis. Correct. Or the vice You, you, okay. I, I agree uh, with my colleagues here with what's been stated. I think ultimately I'm not convinced that the zoning administrator's rationale uh, uh, is adequate. Um, I do think we should allow with, with an environmental review and really see what these impacts are according to the community, get some data behind it so we can see if the project has merit. Um, I really appreciate that opportunity. I, I don't I just have a hard time um, understanding why the appeal was denied. I'm having difficulty with that at this point. Those are my comments. Well, I think they've made some progress in lowering the height. Thing. I think that's a step in the right direction. Oh, I'm sorry. And I think the changing of the character of the base facility from whatever it is, fence to something more stable, whether it's masonry or, or something more permanent, that well, there's going to be a certain amount of noise from generators and so forth in there that might be uh, made it, done away with by a rock or stone wall or something more substantial than oh. what they're showing. Uh, It's it's kind of a sad situation in a sense. You hate to you hate to create a blight in someone else's community, and I understand the attitude about it. You know, you, you, as long as I'm voting on something in somebody else's community, it seems okay. But that's not necessarily the way we feel. I uh, <clears throat> I guess if there were higher mountains around, why this issue could be resolved by landscaping and other things and maybe there's some more landscaping that could be done around this one that would help mitigate some of the impact but I think uh, having seen the amount of issues we've had related to fire and other disaster type things I think we have to make some some uh, effort to live with some of these things we may not like as perfect, but we need them to survive. Because if we don't, 
we don't have the ability to communicate with as many people as we have in our region, there's no way in the world to uh, organize things and get things to, you know, fire issues or whatever, some other kind of disaster. So <clears throat> I think it's, I, for me, it's worth making the sacrifice of having this device in your yard, in your neighborhood for the benefit of the safety that's provided by it, the communications and, and fire and other things. I mean, it could be an earthquake. We haven't had an earthquake in a while. Well, I mean, there's a lot of national disasters that occur uh, that you need communication for now. And <clears throat> I just think because highways are more crowded and you can't go drive where you want to go as easily, if you can communicate, maybe it'll keep some traffic at a minimum. So anyway, I think that I think it's a small price to pay for some uh, for some safety and some uh, uh, ability to sleep well at night. I guess <laughs> type thing. Uh, could I ask uh, County Council and Ben? Could you put up your recommendation again, mm -hmm. please? Um, if we were to say that we wanted this project to go forward, we're obviously not going to go in for that language. What would uh, be the appropriate way of addressing it? Uh, if you decide you want the project to go forward, then I think the, the motion would be to uh, recommend tentative approval of the appeal um, and ask staff to return with findings and conduct environmental analysis that could be reviewed prior to making that final decision. Um, and that continuance would be to an open date and time. Um, that would then need to be re-noticed. Um, and also for all the people that are here that would want notice, then we would set up some sort of email list or something um, so that they can provide addresses to get noticed with it. So the, in short, the motion would be for a tentative approval of the appeal with direction for staff to um, do the findings and environmental analysis and come back at an open date and time. Without having to regurgitate all of that, can we just say slow move? I'm just a comment on my part uh, first is I would pretty much agree with what's being said here. Safety is critical, uh, especially with um, the potential for disaster. Been doing a lot of thinking about the rural character, and, and the rural character has tractors, it has generators, it has all kinds of stuff. And the other thing that they've been thinking about is this cell tower is kind of the new technology that used to be water towers and uh, windmills that were in rural areas. This happens to be this decade's uh, piece of infrastructure out in rural areas. So, you know, it's something to consider when we evaluate these projects. Um, you know, recently I went up to Idaho, and like you said, those cell towers are everywhere, and they're not hidden like a tree, but it's just part of the rural landscape because this is the infrastructure uh, that is pro providing the protection uh, within rural areas. So, my thoughts. I take that as an official motion, piggybacking on I'll your words. Say it, say it. I'll say it. No, I'm not going to try to say it again. I'll <laughs> I will. Say okay, you say it. Okay. okay. Uh, well, so the the motion that I suggested would be for tentative yeah. approval of the appeal yeah, change your mind in your with staff to return uh, with findings in conducting an environmental analysis, um, and that it, the um, open that return would would occur at an open date and time. Yeah. So move. Okay. Second. Okay. Okay, we second. have a motion and a second. Yeah, and actually, um, it was it would be likely that staff would return with modified condition based on the direction uh, provided <laughs> that would include uh, maintenance of foliage, uh, some sort of non-combustible wall, and uh, decommissioning of the structure when it's no longer needed. Thanks. Yes. Add that. So we have a motion. Second. Did, did we include uh, some piece about the environmental review in your reviewing that CEQA exemption? Is that part of your motion? Right. So part of the motion would be that staff would conduct an environmental analysis okay. uh, and would come back with that finding, which Great. may be an exemption. It may be a negative declaration. It may be an EIR. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, co public comments are over. So, Sue, a, a motion and a second. Again. Uh, I have a first, 
by Mr. Nader and a second by Mr. Moss for the tentative approval of the third party appeal to a future date and time um, where staff will provide new findings and connecting environmental analysis and uh, modified conditions of approval. Could I have a motion, uh, I'm sorry, a vote from Mr. Cannon? You're going to continue with an open date? Yes, to continue to an open date and time. Okay. Before I vote, Mr. Chair, could we clarify for all of those watching and those in the audience that this motion that was made and seconded is to deny the zoning administrator's decision. That's a part of that. So this will go back, it'll be continued, and then the county will reanalyze or analyze some of the aspects that were not considered before. Thank you for the clarification. Okay, so a vote from Mr. Cannon. That clarification made, yes. Thank you. Mr. Herzog. Yes. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Nader. Yes. Mr. Haugie? Yes. Mr. Sevison? Yes. Mr. Moss? Yes. Thank you. All right. And just real quick, Chairman, uh, so there was a list, a sign-in sheet. Most people put either their email or address, just so everybody will be notified of a future hearing. Uh, we'll put that list back up on the table over there, so if you did not include that information, be sure to do so, so we can reach out to you. And, and clarification from County Council. Uh, there's no appeal to this since it's coming back and the commission will evaluate this at a later time, correct? That is correct. All right. right. And you. also, uh, public comment was closed on the hearing, so there's no requirement to reopen it, but um, it, I guess it is possible if the chair wants to, they can do so at the continued time. We'll make that determination then. All right. And let's take a five-minute break, and then we'll come back for the um, next item on the agenda.
We have a quorum, so uh, let's bring the meeting back to order and uh, presentation. Sam and uh, Wayne. Oh, and here comes Sue. Oh, there's EJ, but County Council, okay. Okay, here they come. <laughs> All right, I think we're ready to begin. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Chris Schmidt with the Planning Services Division. This item before you is also an appeal to a zoning administrator decision to a grant a side setback for a property in the Penryn area. The project location is at 2038 Sicily Road, north of Taylor Road and also English Colony Way. Zoning in the area is uh, commercial, uh, design historic review to the south. Neighboring residential parcels are predominant, predominantly residential agriculture, minimum building site of 100,000 square feet. Um, this area is also unique that some of these parcels also have um, RAB20 zoning if they're on sewer. So this property in question is RAB20 because it is connected to public sewer. Of the variance uh, request, on September 19th, 2019, the zoning administrator took action to approve a variance to allow for a nine-foot setback for an existing 300-square-foot garage, detached garage, where 15 feet is normally required. So here's a site plan. Uh, north is to the right, so it's kind of flipped. The garage is on the west side of the property. Setbacks on the site, this is a corner property. There's Sicily Road on the east and a private road to the north, so it has two front setbacks, a 35 feet from edge of right away along Sicily Road. The, at the owner, the Semenyuk's, did receive a variance for a front setback of 15 feet along the private lane some, uh, a few years ago to match 15 foot side setbacks on the west and the south. So that shows your building envelope on the, on the site. And the re variance request was for nine feet on the western property line. Here is a bird's eye view of the property. There's the detached garage, the Semenyuk house here, Sicily Road, the private lane, and the appellants, the Kraus family, lives here. Just a few uh, photos. On the left is the new house the Semenyuk's built on the property. The bottom photo, the detached garage is on the left, and the rear of the house is on the right. You can see that the backyard does slope. They have terraced it for landscaping purposes. And the bottom right is the landscaping between the garage that's the subject of the variance and the property line, the Krauss property, would be on the left. And a couple more pictures of the Krauss side of the garage. On September 27th, an appeal of the planning, sorry, it should be zoning administrator's approval of the variance was filed by David and Kelly Krauss, the neighbors to the west that live at 2044 Sicily Road. The appellant cited the following issues as the basis of the appeal. The decision was made with incorrect conclusions, including confusion with the property lines and representations that the garage did not have power, water, and sewerage. The variance, variance is injurious to them, the nearest property owners. The findings are conflicting because of discrepancies in the listed distance between the fence of the garage and the size of the discrepancy could alter the setback variance findings as to the health and safety of neighboring properties since the garage is now going to be used as a living space. But what's really in dispute here is the location of the property line. So the Semenyaks owned this whole site previously and split the property into two in 2006. The tentative map showed that existing garage to be 15 feet. After the lot was split, this driveway was removed, and another outbuilding that was in the side setback was demolished. And here you can see that the, it was represented as being 15 feet from the new property line from the land division. So the Semenyuks uh, built their house and then started renovations to the garage uh, back in uh, 2018. They did not have a building permit at the time. The Krauses... Um, 
filed a complaint with code and enforcement about the renovation work and also questioned how close the garage was to the property line. So here is the site plan of the garage renovation plan that was submitted to the county and showed a 15-foot setback. There was an existing chain link, fe chain link fence dividing the properties. Um, the chain link fence was about 12 feet from the garage. The Krauses conducted a corner survey, survey back in 2018, and the, the surveyor who did that survey estimated that the, the real property line was one to two feet east of or into the Semenyuk property of the chain link fence. And based on that corner survey, the Krauses removed a section of that chain link fence and installed a metal fence about nine feet six inches from the garage. So there's a few possible fixes for this. <clears throat> the Semenyaks could resurvey the, the site to dispute the location of the property line, demolish all or a portion of the garage, complete a boundary line adjustment with the Krauses so they can meet the 15 foot setback, or they could apply for a variance. And they applied for the variance. So they didn't want to, to do, um, dispute the property line. Or they asked for a, three, a nine foot setback for the existing garage where 15 feet is normally required. So at the ZA hearing and also on the building permit, it was represented that the project was going to bring uh, power, water, and sewer to the garage. Uh, the permit says that work was going to be done. The only thing they're bringing to the garage is power, so no water and sewer. The appellants claim that the variance is injurious to them. The garage has existed since at least 1999. When the appellants purchased the property in 2013, obviously the garage was still there. The variance is to the setback and not the use of the garage. So they're asking for a nine-foot side setback. And I'll just point out that with the new state laws for accessory dwelling, dwelling units, in AD you could have a four-foot setback today, and we would have no say in that matter. So it, it could be worse. So the variance, under the zoning ordinance, the garage may be used for additional living space, a workshop, or a guest house with a bathroom and other living space, but not kitchen facilities. If they wanted to make it an ADU, they'd have to come in and get permits for that. The garage within the side yard setback does create a circumstance unique to the subject parcel. Applying the full ordinance standards would not allow the garage to remain where it is located without doing a boundary line adjustment or significant, significantly altering the structure. There were um, some number mistakes, clerical, clerical errors in the zoning administrator staff report. The fence to garage distance error in the staff report does not change the material facts of the variance request. Alter the grounds for the variance or alter the findings. The renovated garage will not be detrimental to the public welfare or injurious to the neighboring property. The renovation of existing structure with no additional square footage constructed does not intensify the garage's impact on the Semenyuk property or the Krauss property adjacent to it. The, the appellants claim that the findings are conflicting due to discrepancies in the staff report. Due to lack of reason reasonable alternatives, staff believes that there are exceptional circumstances and conditions applicable to the subject property that do not generally apply to other properties in the vicinity. The side setback requirement creates an unnecessary and unreasonable regulation but makes it impractical to require compliance with the applicable setback standard. The strict application of the zoning ordinance denies the property owner privileges enjoyed by other owners in the vicinity in identical zoning districts. The nine foot setback request grants relief and allows the applicant to legally leave intact the presently located garage. The appellants claim there's health and safety impacts. The primary purpose of a setback standard is to protect the aesthetic character of an area by providing an offset of structures from the adjacent properties. The variance does not allow for a change in height or size of the existing garage. Granting this variance would not, under the circumstances and conditions applied in this case, be injurious to the neighborhood or otherwise detrimental to the public welfare it will not cause substantial detriment or impact to the public good. And with that, staff recommends that we, the commission deny the third party appeal filed by the Krauses and uphold the zoning administrator's September 19, 2019 decision to approve a variance to allow a nine foot setback for an existing 300 square foot garage where 15 feet is normally required 
subject to the conditions of approval attached to the staff report. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, questions? Uh, Chris, uh, you mentioned that under the new uh, law that just took effect from the state uh, on secondary dwellings, they mm -hmm. now can be four feet from the property line. Is that correct? They trump our setback standards. And is that on any parcel? If somebody wants to put a secondary dwelling uh, that can be four feet anywhere? I believe it's every parcel, including in communities where CCNRs or HOAs block. Really? They even override this. They override yeah. everything. They override everything. Yeah, one of the other interesting overrides is you can add 30 feet to the height of a building. So if you have a 30 foot standard and you're putting in a low or a ADU or housing for affordable, you can go up to 60. It, I with, write. Within four feet and of within, the property line, you yeah. can have a 30 foot structure. Uh, that that would be no. That would be for the apartment. No, I'm saying that would be for an apartment complex. Yeah, yeah. No. But but the state has come in and and basically taken over. You know, for the this county is insane. ordinances. Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, hey, Chris. Uh, question. Uh, my question. There's been lots of changes, but I want to go back to the original decision. And I've seen some tape measures and some lines next to the base of the structure. I think I've seen some numbers where we also consider the roof and the pitch. And with the original decision, are, are we considering these, measure, these measurements to include the roof or just at the base? It, and is it, that appropriate? It's the base of the wall. And in the zoning ordinance, we, we allow an overhang okay. for eaves and also sometimes for garage, or I mean, not garage, fireplace. Box outs can go into okay. the side setback. Okay. But the structure itself, the wall, is where you measure your setback distance. Other questions? Yes? Um, just what year did you say that the garden was built? Uh, 1999 or earlier. Prior to that. Yes. And they, they purchased the property then? In 2013. They've lived there for, for six years. Problem? Yeah. Um, I believe it was the, the start of the renovations which spurred the inquiry. Okay. I, to, to me, a big chunk of this is a, a property line dispute. And, to, you know, that's more of a civil matter than it is a, a planning matter. Um, although I think applying for the variance is probably the most passive way to go about resolving it. Um, but uh, anyway, that answers my question for now. Thank you. I have one more, Chris. It looks like from the pictures that there's some kind of a concrete, right? Well, you have part of it. That, that concrete can, it connects both this garage to uh, these uh, appellants' property. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why that hasn't been removed and a wood fence put up or something if they want to have a little bit more barrier there. Yeah, I since see they it, planted some trees in there. Since it was all one property, there was a concrete pad there that is still there. I'm just surprised it hasn't been removed. Because I can understand how that may look like it actually goes with other property. So, Chris... You know, when, when the parcel was split, they assumed that it was a 15-foot differential. What happened? When this was submitted by the surveyor, they represented it was 15 feet. I see. So The I surveyor was wrong then. We're not going to point fingers, but all right. yes. I'm just curious to know the history. So, all right. Other? Okay. Oh, go ahead. I guess with regards to that point, uh, I think the staff report referred to uh, uh, a surveyor coming out and placing corners, the, the, but not necessarily uh, resurveying the property line. Is that correct? Correct. The Krause has paid for a surveyor to come out and do the corners. And, and so that, that corner above the... Uh, well, you can see there's a, a bend here. So they actually did put a marker there. And I think okay. I have a picture of that someplace. And it's to see but it's it's about right here that where the bend is and so it appears that uh, the property owner with the barn is not disputing the survey it chose not to, to fight that but just ask for the simple 
simplest out would be to get a variance. Any other questions of staff? If not, well, one thing, no. you know, I guess this may be kind of a erroneous thought, but uh, all the windows are on the, well, I guess, south side or whatever side of that house it is. Correct. I mean, the, there is just a door the on, on the west side. side. But the door is on the other side. Yeah. And if I was wondering if that's a problem, can they put the door, I mean, relocate the door, just have a solid wall? That would be just a question that maybe comes up later. Yeah. If that's a problem, I don't know if that's a problem. It's a potential mitigation measure. Okay. All right. At this time, uh, the appellants. Good afternoon. My name's John Bilheimer. I represent Dave and Kelly Kraus in this uh, appeal from the grant of a variance. Uh, let me be clear. The Krauses do not object to a variance for a garage. Uh, in the zoning, uh, the zoning administrator was told that there was a building permit issued on April 10th, 2018 to convert the existing 360 foot detached garage into living space. Construction ongoing. The conditions of approval state the variance allows an existing garage to be located nine feet from the western property line where 15 feet would normally be required. So the variance is granted for the purpose of a garage, not a living space. We have made a decision to not object based on, as the uh, commission heard, the fact that this structure was in existence at the time my clients purchased the property. But what has changed is that there was a potentially ongoing unpermitted use that uh, the uh, Semenyaks uh, eventually decided to seek a permit for living space, and the zoning administrator was told uh, in the hearing that uh, the Semenyaks were not seeking uh, power, uh, water, or sewer, but in fact, that's what the permit was for. So now, on this appeal in your packet, uh, you're being told, the Semenyaks completed their new residence at 2038 Sicily in September 2018 and obtained a building permit in 2018 to renovate and convert the existing detached garage to storage space. Well, that's not what that permit was for. It was to convert it to living space. And so our concern is that this um, grant of a variance was based on incorrect information. And this incorrect information is still being promulgated to this commission when you're being told uh, that the 2018, uh, the Semenyaks were desirous to renovate and convert the existing detached garage to storage space. If a permit is required for a garage uh, to become storage space, we're all in deep trouble because every single garage is already storage space. So my point would be simply that we do not object to the grant of a variance for a garage, but not for living space. And the problem is we have a somewhat inconsistent grant of this variance because it says, okay, you have a, you've been granted a variance for a garage, notwithstanding that there has also been the grant of a building permit for living space. So I would request that 
the appeal be granted insofar as that the grant of a variance is limited to so long as the garage is just used as a storage space, but not when it comes to a living space because we haven't gone through that process correctly. Well, as you just heard, our hands are pretty tied now by the state that if they want to come in and put, anybody wants to come in and put a, a secondary dwelling within four feet of property line, they have the right to do that. So I'm not sure we have a real choice about that matter. I would argue process, process, process. And that is that issue is not now before you, but rather the issue is your uh your zoning administrator, that's not currently before us. There, it, as I understand it, it's been represented that the Seminyuks do not seek this to be an accessory dwelling unit. I think that's identified on page 13 of your packet. But they have the right to do that. And, and, I'm not, and, and, and we can cross that bridge when right. we come to it. But that's not currently before us. It, it's whether or not this grant of a variance was based on the correct information. And in fact, the zoning administrator simply said, we approve it for a garage. But that doesn't, we have to get, everyone's got to be on the same page. That's all the Krauses are arguing. And that is that, okay, is this grant of a variance for that building permit which allows a living unit? Or is it for a garage? The, the zoning administrator says it's just for a garage. So if that's all it is, that's fine. But that's not what that's not what it, I I see this as. So we have a we have a problem with uh, with the clarity of what's been granted. And if if well, it, we'll it, let it, staff address that after you're okay. Okay. Any questions? Any other questions of the commission? Uh, well, I, I guess, I don't know if it's a question, but what I'm hearing you say is that there's really not a dispute here if it's uh, storage space. If it's storage space, there is no dispute. I, I don't, I, we could go into whether or not it was a proper grant of a very, I'm not, we're not going to uh, die on that hill. As long as it's limited to the grant of a variance or a garage or slash storage space, but not a living space. Okay. Okay. And so you're concerned, though, that there's a building for it that allows more. <laughs> the, as I understand it, and you'll forgive me for, as I understand from my review of the file, it is there was the grant of a permit for living space, whereas the, this commission is being told on page three of your packet, and I, I would argue somewhat incorrectly, that this commission's being told. Uh, in, 20, in September 2018 and obtained a building permit to renovate and convert the existing detached garage to storage space. That's not my understanding of what that permit was for, to convert a detached garage to storage space? So storage space to me, pardon me for, Go ahead. to me is by use, not by design, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I can take any room in my house, Agreed. whether it has a kitchen, a bath, a fireplace, or whatever, and designate it storage. I don't disagree. It's, it's, it's the, the intent of the user, not the method of construction or the, the, the extent of the improvements. Um, conditioning that intent, especially in light of the new state laws we're hearing about, I don't think would be an enforceable condition. And that's what I'm getting you're asking us to do, is nope. to go ahead and approve the variance, but try to condition it against the state laws that could allow it to be converted to a dwelling unit. And, and, and I don't think that's a, an enforceable position for the county to take, from what I understand. I don't think that issue is before the commission right now, whether or not this is an accessory, accessory dwelling unit subject to... Uh, we're, we're, we're saying it's storage, but I'm just saying that you're asking for a condition to be placed on there that says it can't be an accessory dwelling unit 
and I don't believe that we have the, the legal foothold to make that condition and enforce it based on what I'm hearing of the new state laws. And I'll leave that to... Yeah, no, I'll, I'll jump in here real quick. Um, to the extent you were to uh, modify the approval so that an accessory dwelling unit could not be allowed, that would be impermissible. Um, but um, what you're being asked is to, um, is to look at the appeal on the zoning administrator's decision. And when I look back through the staff packet that... Uh, the attachment, right? I believe it's maybe attachment B. It's on page 56 through 58 of the packet. It's the action agenda for the zoning administrator's decision. And I don't see anything in this action agenda that indicates that the variance was uh, approved by the zoning administrator specific to a garage um, or anything that kind of delineated the use. It states, uh, I'll read it in full. Notices, uh, it says appealed and then it lists the item and the item states, notices hereby given that the Placer County Zoning Administrator will conduct a public hearing on the date and time noted above to consider a request from the property owners, Victor Semenyunk, for the approval of a variance to allow a nine foot setback where 15 feet is normally required. The subject property assessor's parcel number 32-220-061-000 comprises approximately 1.1 acres and is currently zoned uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but it doesn't indicate anything in there that that variance uh, was granted for garage use. It was simply to a structure. So um, there may be contradictions in the staff report that's provided for today. Um, but when I look back at the zoning administrator's action, I don't see that it being use specific. Yeah, you know, I guess it raises the question, uh, what do you do about the building permit? Because uh, I don't know if you object to them having power in the building, but that would require a, a, it's, a building it's, permit. It's, living, it, it's more of a living thing. We, we want to be good neighbors to these people. It's more of a living thing. If they want to go out there and turn on their light for storage so they can fumble around, and, who cares? It's, it's, it becomes a different issue when people start living in it. Then the impact of the lack of the 15-foot setback. And, and as I say, we're not in this four-foot world yet here. But oh, yeah. we are. Well, not, we are in, not in this application. But anyway, let's stick with the issue. Uh, yeah. And, so and that's still, you so, know, I mean, if they wanted to have uh, all the accoutrements that go with the existing building permit, that doesn't necessarily mean that they were going to make a living quarter, does it? Uh, I, I see not if the, permit, if the permit says you can have it for living. My understanding is well, that's that's what your own report said. Your own staff says it's for, is for living conditions. And so, yeah. I have a question. Well, that's, yeah, yeah. We there's kind of a there's a I have a, I have a, a question here yeah. or something because uh, they have a, a building permit. It doesn't talk about living quarters necessarily, but it does. But at any rate, we have a variance, and uh, so you have a variance proposal and a building permit. And I think we're dealing with the variance, aren't we? Correct. I think you are. Yes. So we're not dealing with the building permit? No. No, I think you're right. And so uh, basically all we can do is deal with the variance. I, so, I do think you should, I, I agree, except that your zoning administrator uh, granted it based on that it would be a garage. That, that, that's what I'm, that's what I'm trying storage, to. said storage, didn't he? He called it storage. I'll, I'll read from their conditions of approval. Mm -hmm. This variance allows an existing garage to be located nine feet from the western property line. That was how the, why the zoning, I mean, if we, if we want to go back through the process, and have the zoning administrator do it based on living space. That's the point, is that, the, that it was represented during the hearing that it wasn't going to be for living space. And the conditions <coughs> of approval say, well, it's just, it's, it's approved for a garage. The variance is approved for a garage. Well, yeah, and... Uh... And, and now we go to the, now we go to the, so there's a, it, it, I, what I would suggest is that you go back and the zoning administrator consider the application for a variance based on 
the fact that it can be living space because that's not how he or she approved it. Well, it, it doesn't necessarily mean living space if they have uh, water and sewer and power to the building, does it? Well, I'm going on what was submitted to the, uh, what comes right out of your staff report, and that is the building permit issued on April 20, 10th, 2018, to convert the existing 300 square foot detached garage into living space. So, so this, a question for the staff. You know, when we're looking at variances, we are not generally giving a variance on setbacks based on uses. It's the building and, and where does a building go. So I have never seen a variance granted based on the use of a facility. It's just your build, a building can be within this distance. Exactly. That is correct. Uh, variances are typically granted to the building, not to the use. Correct. And, and in this case, the reference to the garage, that's an existing garage that they asked that that existing building be granted the variance for 9P. Right. I, okay. It seems to be that way from the documentation and from the zoning administrator's action that the reference to a garage is more a descriptor than it is a, a use restriction. So another question that kind of was brought up about the door, would it be appropriate if the commission denied this variance but noted if it became a uh, dwelling unit that that door be moved away from that nine-foot setback and uh, come somewhere else? But I... You know, at this point in time, the law is you can build an ADU there and we can't stop mm -hmm. it, period. That, that is the law. Right. But, so before you right now, it's the zoning administrator's decision, and you can grant or deny that with conditions as long as those conditions are All right. um, related to the property usage. I need to have more comments from... Yeah, you, no, yeah, we're not yeah. done here yet. So <laughs> are there any more questions of the commission of, of the appellant? Okay. What about the property owner? Are they here and Thank they you. want to make a statement? Hi, my name is Nina Semenyuk, the property owner. I don't know where they got assumption about living space. There is a permit, original, and it says garage or shed. He never had any living space. There is pictures from old garage, and the planner, Mr. Planner, he has pictures. Nothing been done, no water, no sewer, except electricity. All the electricity was in garage. We had to... Just uh, we got permit for this building, and we need a reinspection for electri electric, electrical. But never been. I don't know who made this story about living space. The, this is original permit. It says garage or shed, no living space. Um, and do, one. I realize that's an original. Do we need to provide some evidence that to sue for the record? I'm not quite sure what you well, she, she's providing some evidence here, and I'm just wondering how that is. Right. If, if she wanted that to be part of the public record, then we would need to make a copy of it or, okay. or do something to right. that extent. Did, did, that, did that approval of the building permit include uh, water and sewer? Uh, there was application, but for sh not for living space. Oh, I know, but it included water but and sewer. But we changed it after these uh, discussions and... After arguing with neighbors, we changed not water, not sewer, just electric. But electricity is there. It was always there more than 25 years. We did not change in size. Okay. Yeah, we understand. just put new roof because it was leaking. Yeah. And why it's garage door? Garage door was towards neighbor's property. So we closed the garage door and small, made small garage just for access. And it became, became storage because we could not use it as a garage because garage door was towards the neighbor's property. And neighbors just started to encroach our property. They moved fence to feet. They used our corner of our property, 10 feet, for their access. We, don't, we didn't, didn't, didn't tell them anything. But now we have to recover our property back because they are starting encroaching, discriminating, like they offending us. So they don't even mention that they use 10 feet of our corner for their access. It's our property, but they don't say that. And they moved fence, and like three owners before us had this. And they moved in fence more and more, and now we are like, oh, it's now nine feet. But building was always there. It did not change, no size, no location, nothing. So it's like grandfathered. So I don't know what is the question. And the roof is okay, the building appearance is okay, and we would like to live in, enjoy the property without any harassments and 
any like offenses and encroachments, they will they promise we will be doing this to you all the time. You will not you will not live here. We will make you move because you will see us. So they are doing all these things just to make give us a hard time. But I think it's not fair. We are American citizens paying taxes and like everybody else, we are not touching anybody. So they made story about living space. No one is living. We are two people in a big house. We don't need living space. But we have right to have living space, but we did not apply for the living space. We have permit, and nobody pays attention to storage or garage. Everybody's thinking it's living space. So please help. Thank you. Any other questions from the commission? OK. Then it would be appropriate to ask if there's any uh, public comment. Can I talk after this gentleman, please? <coughs> yes. Either David Cross. Uh, 2044 Sicily. Just wanted to comment a couple times. We did purchase the house with that. There was actually, I believe, three buildings there. Uh, this was an open field where they built their house. There was no electricity to that garage. There was a huge garage door and a crappy roof. We had an issue saying, hey, what's going to happen with this? He I'm not going to go too much into it, but if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, sir, law enforcement experience, this has been very difficult. And to have it say that a clerical error of six feet and a, a surveyor is wrong, the surveyor was completely right, the numbers don't match up. And they got it by these people, one's a... a 30-year realtor speaking three languages. The other is a developer. So we got stuck behind the eight ball. We banged the drum. And we're stuck, so please help us. Because we've been trying. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Any other public comment? OK, if not, let's bring it back to the commission. Um, any discussion on the part of the commission? Sam? Shall I begin? This is a nebulous case, um, no matter how you look at it. <clears throat> and it reminds me of a, the good neighbor policy and, and being friendly with your neighbors. And I have happened to have had an unfortunate experience with a neighbor who built an uh, addition to his structure that went all the way to the property line next to my house. Now because it was a place that I would go to infrequently, um, seasonally, from, from time to time, I didn't see that until much later. So here we have the case of a, a, a couple of um, a property owners that have done all the right things. Um, they're basing their, um, their premise on the interactions that they have had with the county, and there appears to be some inaccuracy in which the county's surveying and uh, as well as some other additional problems that weren't there originally this was one lot or one property owner when you split it in half like that it's not an exact measurement so the the point that there's 10 feet of of uh of variance is being well it's not variance 10 feet of the property owner uh the seminux are uh allowing their neighbor to drive across shouldn't be um forgotten because that's the good neighborly policy I'm talking about. They've said that they are, don't have no intention of turning it into a, into a, re, a residential situation. They want it for a storage situation. There's two of them that reside on that property. And, you know, and here we have a state law we're, we're, that, that may override the whole thing anyway. But that's not, the point is moot. The issue is on the variance and if it was correctly handled. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Other discussion? I, my two, yeah. two cents worth yeah. again that might only be worth half that. I don't know. Um, I, I go back to, and, and I, I've seen this time and time again, this is a dispute between neighbors that has very little to do with the building itself, I believe. I believe it goes much further beyond that. Um, I think if that building and its run down condition was something that didn't prevent them from purchasing the property and living there for a number of years and now that the building has been repaired and 
and brought into a nice condition that's all of a sudden a problem. And it's a problem based on unconfirmed fear that it might be something that it's not. And I just think that we're kind of getting drug along with this through process and it's unfortunate. Um, but I cannot see um, <coughs> denying the variance. The, the structure's been there for all to see for a long time. If it was going to be a problem, it would have been a problem prior to the purchase of the property. It would have been a problem when they subdivided it. It made it into two parcels. One parcel to start with. Other comments from the commission? Okay. Uh, motion? Mr. Chairman? Yes, I'd like to make a motion that we deny the third party appeal filed by David and Kelly Kraus. Second. We have a first and second deny the third party appeal. I have a first by Mr. Moss and a second by Mr. Herzog. So a vote from Mr. Cannon, please. I'm going to vote yes. Given the information that we have to work with, we have to draw that conclusion, of course. Mm -hmm. Mr. Herzog. Yes. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Nader. Yes. Mr. Hauge. Yes. Mr. Sevison. Yes. Mr. Moss. Yes. Thank you. Uh, further like to mention that we uphold the zoning administrator's September 19, 2019 decision to approve a variance to allow for a nine foot side setback for an existing 360 square foot garage where a 15 is normally required, subject to the conditions of approval attached to the staff report. Uh, we have a first and a second uh, to uphold the zoning administrator's report. I have a first from Mr. Moss, a second from Mr. Sevison. So vote from Mr. Cannon. Mr. Cannon, oh, I'm sorry. I need a little bit of clarification on that. If I may, from the motion maker. Did we say structure instead of yes, garage? because it's, it's, it's yeah. confusing. I can see where you're going. Yes, I, I would amend my motion to substitute the word structure or garage. Second conversion. Okay, so that second motion to amend the word garage to structure um, so a vote from mr. Cannon but let me just clarify that motion I believe uh, the motion is the second item on the recommendation with the word uh, garage substituted out for structure so in total the motion would be to uphold the zoning administrators September 19th 2019 decision to approve a variance to allow for a nine-foot side setback for an existing three 160 square foot building or 360 square foot structure where 15 feet is normally required subject to the conditions of approval attached to the staff report exactly thank you thank, thank you chairman former chair or chairman retired at <laughs> for making that for making that clarification i'm a yes okay a vote for mr herzog yes mr johnson yes mr nader Yes. Mr. Hauge? Yes. Mr. Sevison? Yes. Mr. Moss? Yes. Thank you. All right. And, Chairperson, um, since the this appeal, is a, do I have to? Okay. So, uh, this decision can be appealed. Uh, you have uh, 10 calendar days to the appeal, and it's a $619 fee. Correct. And it'll be appealed to the Board of Supervisors. And appealed to the Board of Supervisors. Okay. With that, the meeting is adjourned. Well done.